Uh, Stephen Wilson, for those of you uh, yesterday, uh, you know all about him. But Stephen uh, has been involved in energy engineering of all sorts, grids, gas, and nuclear. He's an adjunct professor at the University of Queensland, was involved with energy futures, uh, but uh, he's got experience in the whole gamut, the economics, the business cases, as well as all the technical stuff. So I'll hand over to Steve and um, we'll continue on. Thanks very much. Thanks, Dave, for the introduction. I, um, of course, I presented the, uh, the UQ study we did uh, yesterday in the session. Um, so, but I'm really here with my independent hat on uh, to take my way. So it's, it's the, uh, the brand under which I do my advisory work. Um, and I've got, so where, where I'm using some UQ material in this uh, slide pack, I've, I've left the UQ label on there to acknowledge the source of that. Uh, so what I've been asked to talk about in this session is the problems that we face with the grid and the, the published plan. Um, and I, I've called, I call this the power cost paradox of renewables, which I uh, touched on a little bit yesterday, uh, but I'll unpack a little bit more today. So this is so. What is this thing that we call the power cost paradox? Well, it's it's very much focused on what's known as the levelized cost of energy, usually abbreviated LCOE. And I think there's pretty broad agreement that the levelized cost of wind and solar is is in the order of fifty dollars. Maybe it's a bit more. Maybe it's a bit less with certain assumptions, uh, you know, you might say it's higher or lower. But let's say, just for the sake of this illustration, it's about that level. And let's say that, uh, and, and indeed, in our, um, in our uh, report here, our estimate of the first of a kind cost for Australia of the small modular plants is on the order of $100 a megawatt hour. We think that that can be brought down over time uh, with series built to, to something like 60. Um, but let's just say we're looking at a $100 price tag. And so this is where, this is where you, we hear um, constantly that, um, well, wind and solar is cheaper, so the argument's over, basically. And, and the, quest, the question I ask people is, well, you know, if you're sitting there and you're a decision maker and you're choosing between these two sources of zero emission generation, which one gives you the cheapest overall total system cost? And what I find is that most people who don't have a technical education, uh, who've not studied engineering, and who don't have a real understanding of systems and systems theory will think that you get the cheapest system by building just that cheap wind and solar. Uh, what's the average of everything costs 50? And the answer is 50. And, and, and unfortunately, that's wrong for system reasons. Um, but when I ask this question to engineers, even engineers who've spent no time at all in their career thinking about energy, they instinctively know that you're going to need to have a certain amount of that $100 nuclear in your system in order to achieve the lowest system cost. That's actually quite an interesting observation. So this, this chart, this is a, an analysis that, uh, so Gabriel Wiasico, uh, who's been doing a PhD under me, he's just submitted his thesis early in his PhD when he was doing his lit review, looking at all the papers around the world that have addressed this question. Most of them are focused in Europe. Um, he, he just did a, a plot, he sort of converted to Australian dollars um, and, and did a plot of uh, estimates of integrating these intermittent variable weather dependent resources into a grid. Um, and the question uh, is, what's the, what are the extra system level costs that you need to add on top of that dollar per megawatt hour number in order to see what does it cost uh, for the system? And actually what he found is, uh, you know, even going back quite a few years now, some of these papers are a decade or more old, there, there have been estimates made uh, of, of what that cost is as a function of the percentage of renewables in the system. So the, but the general finding here is that um, most of the, that literature was European, okay? Most of that literature was focused on less than 50% penetration of renewables. Uh, there's no general agreement on like precisely what the number is. The number, the answer to the question is system specific. But the general pattern is that the more you try and dial up these resources, because they, as I said yesterday, because you, the, the, the output from these things is not controllable and can't be matched to the load, but it's an absolute non negotiable physics requirement that the generation and load be matched in real time, second by second, 24 7. 
and that's what's causing the costs. It's all the money you've got to spend to do the magic to make that happen. It gets harder and harder and harder as you go as you go to the right hand side. I'm just noting passing that uh, not far from here at ANU are some people who think that you can do this really cheaply um, at really high renewable shares. And, uh, and, and so this talk is very much an explanation of why we think that's wrong. Now, Gabriel, uh, early in his thesis, did a residual load analysis, a sort of fairly simple one, and he got a curve, something like that dashed orange line there. He's now done the full system model. And so we can confirm that, you know, we, we've got a deep understanding now of what it costs in the NEM, and we can confirm the general pattern is more and more and more expensive as you try and push to the right. In my view, these estimates are still underestimates because they're still simplifications of the real system and the true cost will be even higher than these estimates. Okay, so saturation is, is, is a real phenomenon. You know, there's, there's an effect that if you just try and keep adding these resources, that, these intermittent resources to the system, you, you have a saturation problem. Now, I'm not just sort of standing up here and making this up. This is a journal paper. Uh, we had pub was published earlier this year. It was prepared uh, some time earlier. Went through a, a, you know the, the usual very slow peer review process, um, written with one of uh, one of my research students, Nisa, who's now doing a PhD over in economics at UQ. He's actually a finance guy, economics finance background. Uh, and Archie Chapman's a really good guy in, in uh, electrical engineering. Actually, a, a, a computer scientist originally, but really knows energy markets. But the big four findings of this are that. There's all these symptoms starting to appear of saturation in the NEM, and the, the four big ones that we talked about is curtailment, the marginal loss factors are moving in uh, in the adverse direction, wholesale spot price risk, and the, and the declining value of, of renewable energy certificates. So um, different reasons behind those, but what this paper basically shows is if you take the perspective of an investor and you look at the, the, these things moving in the wrong direction, the collective effect of that is actually quite bad for the investor. So a lot of what we're hearing in the public domain is all about trying to sort of whack more band-aids on this problem so the investor will keep investing in these resources that the system is and the market and the signals are telling us is not a very good idea. This is a chart from that paper, a um, couple of charts from that paper. So we basically looked at, one of the things we looked at was just looked at the AEMO data what's happening to these marginal loss factors, which is like an adjustment on your generation. Okay, so you, you know, you, you, it's, it's the way that um, transmission network losses are allocated uh, among generators and, and big off takers. Uh, you generate 100 units, but you only get paid for 100 minus whatever, and the, and the difference is your marginal loss factor. It's recalculated every year. It's very complicated model-based calculation every year, and AMO says, righto, Robert, there's your marginal loss factor, David, there's yours, and you just have to suck it up. Okay, and these have been moving in the wrong direction. It's a symptom of saturation. It's affecting wind and solar, but it's also affecting other generators. The, um, the one that stood out was the, the Broken Hill uh, open cycle gas turbine plant as, as one of the sort of victims of this in a, in a particularly difficult part of the network. Okay. Um, so real-time balancing. This, this is a quote actually from a German... There's actually a group of engineers in Germany who are getting pretty concerned about the stuff that all of us are concerned about uh, and started saying so five years ago. And one of the statements in their report, it's an open public report, is this statement. It's just, it's just saying that you've got to balance generation and load exactly to the millisecond all the time and, and if you want a stable power grid. So this actually takes us back to the beginnings, go back a century. This, the so-called current war. If you've not seen the movie, uh, have a look. Um, uh, interesting movie about that that fight between Edison and Westinghouse, and, and of course uh, Tesla uh, had the disagreement with Edison, who was fixated on DC generation, uh, and uh, and Edison was so stubborn that he left and went to work for Westinghouse. The re the fundamental reason is that um, with 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 DC generation, you're restricted to very short, um, very very short distances, and so it's like a power plant in every city block. Uh, otherwise, the losses become too large because you can't transform easily transform DC from uh, to a higher voltage and then back down again. So you need the high voltage. The, those high voltage power lines. The reason we have such high voltages is to have very low current. That's the trick to have low losses. That's the trick to have uh, a big system with large central plants that can distribute electricity to cities and so you know one of the first large central plants of course was at uh, Niagara Falls so so 
these fundamental principles of physics uh, are still apply. So I think the one thing that everyone, I hope, can agree on is that the laws of physics tomorrow will be the same as they are today. So this is, this is a paper. So what does all this mean for power systems? Uh, it's a little bit of wallpaper here. This is another paper. This is an IEEE paper presented at the conference, the Power and Energy Systems Conference, last December by Nick Maurer. By the way, Nick, wonderful uh, student of mine. He's just won the John Monash Scholarship um, that, that BP funds, and he's got his choice of MIT and Oxford and all the rest. Uh, so what's he doing in this paper? I'm going to zoom in on that little diagram there on the top right. So this is a very simplified representation of the power system, and at the heart of it is this thing called the swing equation. So this, is, this allows us to model, uh, what he's doing in this work is he's modeling frequency stability, so which is one of three types of stability that you need to sustain at all times in a power system. Frequency stability, voltage stability, phase angle stability. He's just focusing on frequency stability. Uh, and he's basically asking the question, what happens if we pull out the coal plants and the gas plants and we replace with wind and solar inverter-based generation? What's going to happen to our frequency stability? Um, and there's a little, you can see a little thing on the right-hand side there called Rockoff, rate of change of frequency. Frequency is nominally 50 hertz, but it's always slightly moving a bit above and a bit below, and you're trying to keep it in balance. Uh, so that's a really important number, a really important uh, parameter. Uh, the H in the swing equation is super important, okay, it's the inertia in the system. So, um, so the key thing here is that the, 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 for those of you who are mathematically inclined, the only thing that governs Rockhoff that can use to control the rate of change of frequency is the inertia in the system. And Nick, his model kept telling me, he's like, why is that? I'm trying all these other tricks. And then he looked at the equations. Like, of course, there it is right there in the equation. So, you know, if you pull all the inertia out of the system, H becomes zero and you've got a divide by zero problem, right? A divide by zero problem. And now what is a divide by zero problem? That's when the computer sort of spits the dummy and doesn't know what to do. Uh, and in this case, it's when the physical system spits the dummy and doesn't know what to do. So essentially what happens is the rate of change of frequency just, just, uh, just drops vertically. So you try to maintain 50 hertz stable on the system um, and, and and it's the, it's the inertia that's keeping that stable, that's stopping that frequency when there's a disturbance from falling down vertically. Okay, so it's like trying to balance a pencil on your fingertip, you, you can maybe think of it. Um, and, and so, you, you know, we're, we're maintaining this, the balance in this system. So what's actually happening in the system is we've got these large plants that are doing this balancing job, and we're removing those. So there's less plants to do the, the, the heavy lifting work of maintaining stability, but the, the work of that they're being asked to do is getting harder and harder because of the volatility of the output from the renewables. This is a fundamental, a fundamental sort of stability issue in the system. Okay, so, so Nick's got some charts on this. What he's basically found is that if, if you go too far to the right hand side with too much wind and solar, um, you basically can't maintain frequency stability. Uh, and, and all the attempts to try and solve this problem um, can't solve all the problems simultaneously. Okay, and so you can see, you know, you might solve that first dip there. Look at the blue line. This is um, at uh, 80, 83 percent um, wind and solar penetration. You, know, you might have a disturbance, and your synchronous connect condenser saves you from the first dip. But then they then they've they've done their job. You've shot you've shot the one bullet from your gun, and then you just your inter system collapse. Okay, so, so I mean, AEMO knows this, right? AEMO knows this. There, there are engineers who understand this. And, and this quote from three years ago shows that. And the, and the academics know this. So Tapan up at UQ and, and Richard Gann, these guys know this. So no one really knows how to run these systems like they're talking about. Yeah, so we've got, we've got the NEM, you know, the reality is the NEM sort of looks like that. You see the brown coal, black coal, the orange gas, the wind and solar at the top. You know, we've got this coal dominated system, Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria. We've got this little thing called South Australia. The scales are different. South Australia's tiny, hanging off the side. That's what the South Australian system looks like. Uh, and the Tasmanian system, of course, is all hydro. But these are all linked together in this one synchronous system, which means the frequency is exactly matched right across this system all the time. Tasmania is different because it's a DC connection and there's a little tiny DC connection Murray link. So what happened when South Australia had the storm, that AC connection between South Australia and Victoria bro uh, broke, it was literally physically blown over by the storm. And they were just hanging by that little DC connection and relying on the gas plants to maintain system balance. 
So Tony showed a, a showed, Tony showed a five minute three day five minute resolution picture of South Australia from August. This is the pre islanding and post islanding chart from OpenNEM.org. So what you're looking at in the top line there is before the uh, before the seven pm. Yeah, I think it was seven pm Saturday um, when that. I think it was. Yeah, I think it was sort of there. So I can't see it. But anyway, seven pm Saturday. Uh, where that purple was sort of big coming in from Victoria and then it drops to nothing. And then the, 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 the wind, start, sorry, no, the wind starts to dominate. Um, and then you, you threw into the, um, you, you threw into the period where uh, you've got gas and, uh, and, and the interconnector um, do, doing the, keeping the system in balance. You can see what happened to price uh, through that period. So the South Australia is just hanging on by its fingernails and the thing that they were doing was restoring the uh, system, the connection to Victoria as quickly as they could. There's warning signs in the frequency control and ancillary services market, which used to be a tiny little thing has become bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and so you, you can see that in the AER reports. I want to show you what's happened to prices. Um, so on the, sorry, this, this, the one on the left is not showing properly, but, but the, the chart on the left is, is a very condensed chart of um, prices and demand in, uh, in for every half hour in August 2009, very concentrated. Uh, and, then, and then a decade or so later, the, the price formation, when you have these resources, uh, the wind and solar in the system, it just becomes extremely volatile and uh, essentially non-bankable. Okay, so, so this is the key thing. You, no one can produce a bankable price forecast at this market. Um, and that's why you need basically long-term offtake contracts um, to, to build anything. So it's not just a question, it's not just a challenge for, for nuclear. So it's all about the balancing problem uh, and achieving security and supply. I'm gonna skip over this. Um, and this is basically just saying that you've got, to, you've got to balance all time domains from the very long term to the real time. Um, and you've got to achieve that on a rolling basis consistently. The spot market sits in the middle of that. Uh, so there's huge policy challenges here. I think uh, probably my time's up. I'm going to take a pause here, uh, or just just wrap up here, um, and then later on we can probably get into uh, Q and A uh, if people are interested. Thanks, Steve. That was uh, trying to condense a really complex issue into a simple message. Um, our next speaker, um, James Slade, another amazing engineer. So um, thank you for the introduction, David. Uh, my background is as an electrical engineer, uh, practiced in that for uh, about six years uh, in pre-technical roles, uh, and then moved on to um, project management, construction and commissioning. Uh, we had, we had um, a series of contracts there as a, a small business, and then I've spent the last uh, 10 years designing and building uh, and operating um, Australia's largest energy projects, which are our LNG fleet over in, the, in, Western, uh, over in Western Australia and building um, subsea gas gathering infrastructure. So, um, you know, I've done quite a few different parts of the overall energy sector, upstream oil and gas, solar, um, gas fire generation. And, uh, I enjoy the whole lot of it, it's a bit of a tragic. So Andy's given me the uh, short, I drew the short straw. I got to talk, I get to talk about entropy, um, which I happen to find fascinating, but few people do. <laughs> there's two things, there's two things that we really need to understand about entropy, okay, without going into the details. The first is the negative. It's an unfortunate fact of life. It's why everything wears out. Everything rusts away, everything breaks down. Okay, the humans constantly have always and will always have to fight against entropy. Just to stand still, this is not to grow the economy or to drag millions of people out of poverty to a better way of life. Just to stand still, we need to constantly apply enormous amounts of energy and raw materials to our built systems just to maintain where we are today. So that's the negative. Um, and to, to give you a little bit of an idea of I guess, a, you know, a practical everyday thing. When you brake in your car, a little bit of your brake pads and a little bit of your tyre vaporises. 
turns into dust. That's gone forever. You can't get that back. We can't reassemble that dust into a new tire. Not without enormous quantities of, of energy and, and new materials, okay? So, but that happens at every scale. It happens with every aspect of our, our technology in our built world. How does energy apply to, uh, how does entropy apply to energy specifically? So, entropy is a bit confusing. It's kind of the reverse of quality. So, low entropy is good. Engineers like low entropy systems. There's a lot of Im embedded energy in a low entropy system. High entropy, that's the atmosphere in this room. There's, there's nothing. We can't do anything useful with it. Okay, it doesn't, it doesn't, there's, no, there's no concentration of energy there. So what I'm going to do, and there's no value judgments implied, instead of talking about low entropy and high entropy, I'm going to talk about high quality and low quality. On the left-hand side, you'll see an inflated balloon. The air in that balloon is squashed together. It doesn't want to be like that. Of course, it wants to be just like the rest of the air outside. It's squashed together, and it's, it contains an amount of embedded energy. Okay? It's high quality, low entropy. Once it's popped, that energy is gone forever. To reinflate the balloon, we need to add new energy from somewhere else. But the energy that was there is gone forever. The important thing is, when it went from a low entropy to a high entropy system, did we capture any useful work? How much did we capture? And at what efficiency did we capture it? And that's what engineers are obsessed with. Entropy works in one direction, sadly. You would not expect this balloon to spontaneously reinflate itself. Those, that air, okay, those different molecules will not reassemble inside that balloon without us doing something. So it only goes in one direction. It's difficult to um, necessarily compare entropy of different sources. Um, you can do it, but it's, it's complicated. I won't go into it here. But a pretty good um, proxy is energy density. It's not the same, but, but it's close enough. And, and when we talk about quality, again, we're not implying a value judgment. There are technical characteristics about the energy density and the available and the, the usefulness, I suppose, of the fuel. So let's have a look at entropy through history, okay? the way uh, humans have used it. You probably can't see this, but this is a field, green grass, sunshine. Okay? This is what humans did for energy for most of recorded history. The grass was grown to feed draft animals, which provided our motive power. And the wood, which we cut down, was um, obviously used to heat our you know, homes and, and, and early primitive industry, blacksmiths and all that sort of thing. We relied on pretty weak intermittent flows of energy. I mean, the sun is massive and a huge amount of energy hits the earth, but actually it's not very concentrated, it's quite diffuse. And then a confluence of events in England made the ponds turn to coal. Okay, they clear felled most of the UK, so they were running out of wood. Um, London couldn't get enough wood in to keep warm, and so they started uh, increasing their imports of coal from, from the north. As they did that, as they used more coal, a much higher entropy, higher quality fuel than grass and wood, their knowledge increased and their technical capacity to extract useful work from that coal increased. In the beginning, they can only extract a small amount of useful energy from burning that coal. Remember, once it's burned, of course, it's gone forever. But over a period of about 150 years, they could get more and more and more and more work, useful work, out of the same quantity of coal. The age of oil. John Rockefeller in late 19th century, Pennsylvania, uh, but also the, the Shell Company, or the company we know as Shell today in Azerbaijan, discovered oil and discovered that it was useful could be used, it was very, very dense, it was easily transportable. Initially, they didn't want it for anything but the kerosene, which is actually a small fraction of the overall oil split. Okay, But over the next 70 odd years, engineers and scientists and industrialists found ways to use every last molecule in a barrel of oil. As our knowledge grew, our ability to get useful work from a barrel of oil increased 
exponentially. And gas. The gas transition is still happening. We're still growing the amount of gas used in the world. Gas is a terrific fuel. I'm a big fan. I've worked in the upstream industry all my life. It's very useful, but it does come with some challenges, not least of which is CO2 emissions. And so thinking about this, thinking about this transition through, say, yeah, the last 300 odd years, what do we think our next transition is going to look like? Do we think we're going to reverse the entropic direction of our energy sources? Or do you think we're going to continue this trend? Do you think we're going to go to the densest, most high quality fuel that we know of? Or are we going to revert, albeit with much better modern technology, to very low density, diffuse, weak, intermittent flows of energy? What are the implications of going backwards? I'll point out another thing. Fossil fuels and uranium are stores of energy. The energy is locked into the chemical structure of the hydrocarbons and the atomic structure of the uranium molecule, that uranium atom. These are flows of energy. There's a big difference between a store and a flow. A store you can store, obviously, but you can also utilise it at your leisure, as you need it, okay, in any circumstances. And that is a qualitative difference from not having a decision about when that energy arrives on your doorstep. Flows are great. Wind and solar, you know, wind and sunshine are free, but that's all it's free. Nothing else in that system required to capture and concentrate and store weak intermittent flows is free. And it matters. This is the Human Development Index put out by the UN on the vertical axis here. Okay. It's made up of human life expectancy, education, and gross national income. Here is per capita electricity consumption. We see the, the usual suspects, unfortunately, down at the bottom here. The lowest human development index and the lowest per level capita consumption of electricity. Then we have the middle countries, they're on their way. Okay. And then we're in this group. This is a rarefied atmosphere. A very small portion of the world's population gets to enjoy what we do. And look how much energy we use. Energy density, entropy, our selection of fuels matters. And it matters because it actually changes the quality of human life. Okay, this is going to be equally tedious. We're going to talk about primary energy sources and energy vectors. I won't be offended if anyone walks out. So what is a primary energy source and why is it important? To assess the viability of an energy system, okay, and Stephen and Tony and Rob have talked about systems. We must try and think about systems. We need to understand the characteristics of the primary energy source. So where does all energy come from? The vast majority of it comes from the sun. And I'm stealing a, um, from Nate Hagen's lexicon here. If you don't know who Nate Hagen is, I suggest looking up. He's terrific. We have recent sunlight. This is seconds to a few years old. It includes solar. It includes wind, because wind is driven by the solar cycle. It includes hydro, because the water cycle is driven by the sun. Also includes corn and switchgrass, that sort of thing we use to make biofuels. We have old sunlight, decades to hundreds of years. This is wood and peat. Okay? It's had more time to concentrate. It's had more time to become dense. Okay? Finally, we have ancient sunlight. Oil, gas, coal. Between 10 and 200 million years ago, the sun, through the magic of photosynthesis, Triple charged the Earth's crust with, except for uranium, the densest, most useful, available fuel that we've ever been able to find. Clearly, we are going to consume it at some point. It's an open question when. But I, I can't emphasise the importance of the role of time in improving um, what starts out as a weak, diffuse source of energy, the ancient sunlight, and what time has done to concentrate that into useful form. Clearly, we don't have 10 to 200 million years. But there's another source, starlight. 
In ancient stars, the conditions were such, and this is the only, only uh, place in the universe where the conditions were such, um, that the heavy elements were created, including uranium, including thorium. When those stars died, became supernovas, they threw that, those heavy elements out to space as dust. Over millions of years, they coalesced into planets, and that's what we have today. Okay? These elements store more energy than, than anything else that we know of. Interestingly enough, geothermal is also um, mainly from, from radioactive sources. 90% of the heat in the Earth's core comes from the natural uh, decay of radioactive elements in the Earth's core. That's important. Earth is inhabitable for that reason. I won't bore you with the details, but it's an interesting fact. And the moon obviously drives tidal forces. That's a fraction of what we use, so I won't talk about that much. So can we compare them? This is a pretty dry graph, really, isn't it? <laughs> okay. I'm not sure how well you can see it. Solar is not here. One, because it's, um, well, it wouldn't show up. Um, but two, it's, it's difficult because it doesn't have any mass. So it's hard to sort of compare the weight and the energy density of something that has no mass. But at the bottom, we have wind. A, kil a kilogram of wind at 12 and a half kilometers an hour. That's the prevailing average wind speed of Sydney. Lots and lots of zeros behind that decimal point. Water's a little better when it's got 250 metres of head pressure behind it. Grass and corn, the magic of photosynthesis to concentrate sunlight, it's getting better. Wood, and then we have the big three. And this actually really doesn't do it justice. It's not to scale because it wouldn't fit. But then we have uranium. And you can see it's just simply in a class of its own for energy density. And as we've said, energy density, entropy, it matters. It matters for a whole bunch of reasons. Something that you might be able to relate to a little more. That is around about the largest class of coal tank we have, holds 200,000 tonne of coal. The amount of energy locked in its chemical structure is equivalent to 74 kilograms of uranium. That's probably about the average weight of the people in this room. No, 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 I'm making any assumption. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, mate. You could fly, you could fly decades worth of energy in a small aircraft to these destinations instead of shipping coal. And coal is dense. But how do we make it useful? There's been a, a recent paper, and, and Rob Parker um, uh, brought it to my attention. Um, it's on Grid Brief. I suggest you go and read it. It's, it's pretty good, um, not, not too dry. And it talks about the latent, okay, constant energy intensity of modern industrial society. This is not just the fuel in your cars or the electricity in your homes. It's the power required in your businesses. And it's the Im imbe uh, Im yeah, embedded energy in all your consumer devices, your clothes, your mobile phones, everything in your home, everything. So it's a constant level of energy that we require. And that's about it there. To generate a dollar fifty of GDP, sorry, a dollar of GDP, um, we sorry, we can generate a dollar to a dollar fifty of GDP from one kilowatt hour of energy. So there is a direct relationship here. What it also means is as our economy grows, our demands for energy grow. It doesn't mean that we we bank that energy, we've got that GDP. No. To sustain that GDP, you need to keep applying that energy day after day, year after year. Okay, it's an energy, an ongoing energy demand. These fuels up the top exist at a denser level okay, of, of, of energy density than what our underlying society requires. And this is useful because it means we can store them and it means we can release them slowly at our leisure as we need. Their energy density is more than what we require, you know, just, just to get by. Unfortunately, and I found this out the, the hard way, being a former solar um, farm developer, renewables do not 
exist at a density compatible with more deployed in society. The, the, the energy density is considerably lower than what our demands are. Now, we have the technology, thankfully, to concentrate them. And I like to think of a solar farm as a giant magnifying glass. Okay? Capturing the sun, like kids, you know, burn ants, it concentrates all that energy up and goes out to a tiny little cable. Okay? So we can concentrate it, we've got the technology, but we pay a price to concentrate diffuse weak energy. Okay? It doesn't come without cost. Additionally, we pay an even bigger price to store it, to turn a flow of energy into a store of energy. Physics provides no free lunches. One of the prices is materials intensity. I won't talk on this. Um, Tony Irwin did a great job. His graph's better than mine. But you can see the difference between solar to produce a terawatt hour of energy, the thousands of tons of different types of raw materials required. And at the, at the bottom end, of course, we have combined cycle gas turbines, not the same as what we mainly use in Australia, by the way, uh, and nuclear. Just as a bit of a, a tangent, when I talk to people, they seem to have this idea that once we've finished the energy transition, energy prices will come down. They've got this idea that we can stop building and that the, once the, the right amount of panels and the right amount of batteries and the right amount of wind turbines are there, the job's done, prices will come down. That's not the case. Once you go down this low density route, because of what we talk about with entropy, everything wearing out, everything breaking down, you never stop building. You never get to the end. <clears throat> You're always building. And so that long awaited for price decline, I think Rob Lowe recently put it out 2026 or 2027, it keeps getting pushed out and it will keep getting pushed out because we, we just can't stop building if we go down this route. This is an important one. Energy return on energy invested. This as a metric is not contested. There is something about it that is argued about a lot though. And that's what the break-even value is. Okay, the best estimates that you know, most people sort of agree on is seven. What does seven mean? If you walked up to an energy slot machine, you need to know that if you put one coin of energy into it, you're going to get seven back. And that sounds okay, you know, when we think about modern pokies. But in reality, the modern society that we live in today, we get an ROI of one to 17. We put in one unit of energy, we get 17 back. That's much better. We can see with the higher hydrocarbons, and of course with nuclear, you can walk up to the nuclear slot machine and put a unit of energy in, you get 75 back. That's really something. Unfortunately, down here with solar and, and biomass, and it's even worse when you account for storage, which is the yellow bar, you are not getting enough energy back over the life of those pieces of equipment to, to justify, um, to really justify installing them in the first place. You put a solar panel on your roof for 20 years, it spends the first five years making enough energy to offset the energy that was used to make it. It just, it just doesn't work at scale. And, and this has, um, I suggest again, to maybe go and read that paper for a little bit, because the author explains really well what this means. If we spend more and more of our money and more and more of our waking labour hours and collective societal resources on trying to secure this energy, that's less money we've got for other things. Now we've touched on this briefly, so I'm going to skip through it. Energy since industrialization. That's biomass, that's wood and grass. That's what the world is using. The black line is population. Okay? You can't see it, but there's a tiny little brown blip right there. That's the UK. By 1850, most of their energy was coming from coal, not wood. By the end of the 20th, uh, 19th century, Western Europe, North America had joined the race. They were converting rapidly to coal. We just started to see oil, but it wasn't really making a dent yet. Most of the rest of the world still on biofuels. 
I don't think modern biofuels are unequal to grass. By 1950, we see that coal is being taken up everywhere and we see the populations going up. We also see the start of the rise of the age of oil globally. This is today. Coal, oil, gas make up 85% of the world's primary energy needs. The purpose of me putting this slide up, and I want to impress this, hydrocarbons are a hard act to follow. The energy transition using fuels substantially less available and less dense is as close to impossible, in my view, and the view of many others. You know, we're splitting hairs, whether it's possible or impossible. It's definitely not sensible. Energy vectors, this is boring, but you need to know it. And the reason is, it's never mattered up until recently because there's been plenty of oil in the world. As oil is concentrated in the hands of fewer and fewer nations, and those nations are becoming more geopolitically assertive, we will need to secure at least a portion of our liquid fuels domestically. Not all of it, that'd be, too, that'd be prohibitively expensive, maybe 25%, let's say. And so you were going to hear more about energy vectors. How do we turn solar and wind and nuclear into liquid fuels? And that's what an energy vector is. Here's our primary energy source. Here's our end use. This is your transportation. This is your cooking. This is your refrigeration. Energy vectors are how the energy gets to you. How No one can just rock up at your house with a lump of coal and say, that's your energy. It has to get to you in a form that is useful and that is cheap. Now, electricity is obviously the, the most prominent vector that we have. Very good at transporting power, uh, energy rather, over, over medium distances. It has no um, comparison in terms of distribution. I won't go into these others. This is a vector. We did some work for, um, for a Canadian uh, friend. This is what Justin Trudeau offered to the uh, Germans when they begged him for LNG. This is an energy vector. This is how you turn offshore wind in Canada to electrons on the grid in Germany. All right, you go through this really convoluted process. There's lots of losses on the way, but it can be done. The problem is this. For 10 electrons you produce in offshore Canada, the Germans get two onto their grid. I find it difficult to believe that the Germans will pay for 10 and receive two. Let's see how that project goes. What about nuclear as an alternative? You can ship 1,022 ammonia shipments to Germany, or for the same amount of electrons on the grid, one small coastal-class ship carrying fresh nuclear fuel puts the same amount of electrons on the grid. Canada is a world leader in nuclear fuel. It's astonishing they didn't choose this option. Constraints. Physics is at the top. There's nothing we can do about it. Engineering is, is next. There is, we've got some wiggle room here, but not much. These are hard constraints. <clears throat> Economics, politics, and law. These are downstream. I know they're difficult for you, and I accept that. But I'm not saying they're easy, but compared to physics and engineering, they are softish, let's say. Once you've respected all the constraints, you arrive at a zone of viability. <clears throat> this is what we're heading towards. In case you've noticed, haven't noticed, politics and economics have pushed the zone of viability outside of our viable engineering constraints. And it is to the dishonor of my profession that we have not been better communicators to explain this is not viable. That's why we're here today. Stephen talked about saturating technologies. This is not showing up very well, unfortunately. Um, this orange plot here, is solar and wind. This is what Germany has done. Okay? Solar and wind are very quick to deploy. Okay? But then you reach a saturation limit. They can't get any more onto their grid. You can see nuclear energy in France it took a long time to wind up. You know, when de Gaulle and Mesmer sat down and figured out they needed to be independent of their energy, the French mucked around a fair bit with their own designs before they went with the American design, but eventually they got there. And you can see that this compounds. Okay, so not only is it true at the level of the grid, it's true at the level of total energy. Solar and wind saturate, nuclear compounds. But here's the election cycles, three-year election cycles. This is our challenge. This is how long policy needs to be sustained for. 
in order to get these benefits. Uh, and that's a challenge for the people in this room. So how would an engineer design a grid? Fond thought. This is New South Wales daily load profile taken just before COVID. Okay, morning peak, day plateau, evening peak. You can see that from about six gigawatts and below, that load never, that never goes away, it's always there. Okay, all, all through the year. It's what we call base load. It's not a myth, it's real. Engineers would match technology to that portion of the load. And in Australia, that means coal and nuclear. Other countries have different options. We don't have the hydro. It means coal and nuclear. Then we have this bit. This needs to go up and down. You know, despite what a little bit of the hype says, the current generation of nuclear and some of the designs we're looking at, they can technically do it. They just economically don't like doing it. Combined cycle gas is really good here. Then we have these peaks. These are expensive electrons. Solar, wind, with a little bit of storage, maybe some open cycle gas and hydro. It's perfect for this. This is not precise. This goes up and down. Different places will have different mixes. And if you've got behind the grid storage, or behind the meter storage with your wind and solar, you may be able to push the solar and wind down into the low following zone. Okay? So there could be a bigger role for it. I'll leave it there. I think I've gone slightly over time. My apologies. Okay, we have got James Taylor, another engineer, um, who's done a lot of systems analysis. And he's mentioned it last night that some of his conclusions match exactly the same outcomes that other people have done, approaching it from a different uh, way. But I'll hand over to uh, James. Uh, he's got a lot of myths that he wants to bust as well. Um, so it's going to be an interesting um, session. Thank you very much, David. Uh, my focus in the last year has, uh, and aided by a number of other uh, independent uh, in engineers and scientists, has been directed at the future of the NEM uh, electricity grid as defined by AEMO's uh, integrated system plan. Our public submission last uh, February to the draft ISP process showed that the ISP completely failed to meet government goals for reliability, affordability, affordable cost, I should say, and uh, low emissions. Since the ISP was published in June, carefully ignoring all of our concerns, uh, we engage with uh, AEMO and regulatory agencies to further explain specifically why the ISP presents a grid design for 2030, 40, and 50 that is not only unreliable, but catastrophically so. Surprisingly, in AMO's Electricity Statement of Opportunities report that was published uh, after the ISP in late August, they appear to agree with us when they state that their sophisticated network modeling analysis has found numerous reliability gaps going forward in the next few years. Yet, in our communications with AEMO, they reiterate their complete confidence in the ISP. In an attempt to explain our findings to a wider context, we've now prepared a, a two-page uh, non-technical paper providing 12 reasons why wide-scale renewable energy generation, as described in the ISP, is just not feasible. Our grid has always had a large positive margin of dispatchable power greater than the maximum demand to ensure its reliability. It was over 20% back in 2019. The ISP's planned reserve margin for the future, as it's uh, documented, uh, drives it deep into negative numbers. When you get a minus 50% reserve margin in the middle of the night, that means you're generating only half of the load. That doesn't sound like a reliable grid to me. AMO's plan fails to provide adequate base load generation and energy storage systems throughout even one night. That is a fundamental failing. Why would they avoid using 
facilities such as dispatchable uh, base load power and energy storage. Well, the enormous capital cost and recurring costs for energy storage must be a good start in explaining that. We're told that renewables are the cheapest form of energy. And Stevens uh, address this morning pointed out uh, that their levelized cost uh, methodology uh, has some drawbacks to it. Uh, and, and, and the CSIRO's gen cost report, which they publish every year, says so. So that's widely circulated and, and taken as gospel. But only if one completely ignores all of the costs associated with backing up the renewables when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. And uh, all the transmission lines that a, uh, AEMO are proposing in their ISP as well, and a computer-based command and control system to try and control the entire grid with highly variable intermittent sources of energy. When taken into account, renewable energy is without doubt the most expensive of all alternatives. AEMO plans to build 28,000 kilometers of transmission lines in the faint hope that somewhere in the NEM, when wind and solar droughts occur, there will be enough power to meet all demands. If only it can be delivered to where it's needed. But our analysis, based on assumed 100% perfect interconnectivity, shows there's just nowhere near enough power anywhere in the NEM to meet all demands. And transmission lines simply cannot deliver power that does not exist. In fact, wind and solar have the lowest productivity of any form of electricity generation. And economists, please take note of this, because whereas a base load power station comfortably continues, uh, runs on 70 to 80 percent of capacity factor, as other speakers have, uh, have noted, the wind and solar are down around the 25 to 30 percent, and that's just the average. Solar is zero every single night across the entire grid at the same time. That is a fundamental fact. 16 hours approximately every day, solar is zero. And then it peaks up in the middle of the day to produce huge surpluses. Uh, so uh, this is a, a low productivity type of machinery that's being proposed. And it's difficult to understand why anyone looking for a safe investment of capital in a high-performing asset would give renewables any kind of interest. To guarantee power, as everyone knows, renewables require this firming power. And this either means an entire duplication of the grid with baseload generators running usually far below optimum utilization, as is already happening, or massive energy storage systems capable of duplicating grid outputs for many days at a time. Expensive super batteries, we're told by the media, are being built in Australia. But, and they're touted for firming renewables. This is not true. They're not firming renewables, they're smoothing renewables over very short periods of time. When the clouds suddenly cross over your solar farm, your output drops very rapidly within minutes. That's where a battery is useful. And these super batteries, which are expensive, we're talking about five, six hundred million dollars a piece, can do that smoothing very nicely over a few minutes. But their total capacity lasts only maybe four hours. That's not going to get you through the night. So uh, it, they're only a tiny fraction of what's really required for genuine firming of renewables. Uh, Full-scale, grid-scale grid back, uh, backup for the entire NEM using batteries would cost on the order of four to five trillion dollars and have to be replaced every 10 to 12 years when batteries expire. This is just completely unfeasible and can't be considered. And this is why AEMO has probably uh, downplayed the role of batteries in its plan. 
When it comes to emissions, we get the same kind of claims as with costs. Renewables are zero emission. Yes, only when they're operating, but again, as uh, Stephen and Tony pointed out this morning, the cost of mining and processing and manufacturing the materials, there's over a thousand times more materials for the equivalent amount of power being generated for renewables compared to a base load power station. So that just doesn't uh, stand up to scrutiny. Which brings me to another issue, and that's the uh, lack of a practical and cost-effective means of recycling materials, particularly uh, wind turbine blades and solar panels. Uh, people are researching this now, but it takes a huge amount of energy to break down, melt, separate out the constituent uh, components, and it's just not being done. What we're facing is a massive, highly toxic waste problem in the future, which will probably end up in burial sites rather than being reprocessed. And the large land foot, uh, footprint of uh, of renewables is something that uh, we heard Warren Mundine yesterday uh, state the indigenous people are completely opposed to. Over two million hectares of land would be required for the renewables, solar and wind farms in the uh, ISP plan. The equivalent energy being generated by baseload plants is a very, very tiny fraction of that. Now, we also have to look at what the uh, potential return on investment is for renewables. The plant's large amount of surplus solar power, uh, power during the day, and, and solar is two thirds of all renewables in the plant, uh, means that uh, there's a, a complete surplus compared to what's needed around noontime, and wholesale prices plummet. This has already occurred with the limited amount, the 25% or so of renewables we have today. And uh, so if you're a, an owner, an investor in a solar farm, and you find that your, your market during the day is being rather crowded with people all clamoring to sell their product, and you experience low, uh, you know, low prices, your income's not gonna be terrific. And there's no way at night you're going to sell your product from a solar farm. So it's a mystery to me as to why investors would consider solar farms and solar energy as a viable investment target. And so what will do, what will happen after the coal-fired power plants are out of uh, service and closed down, and we have, according to the plan, nine times more renewable energy than we have today, is we're going to have massive surpluses at certain times of the day and none uh, at night. And this will lead to the, in, in normal circumstances, this would lead to a complete financial collapse of the renewable generation business, just as that's what's happening to the coal business today. Unless, of course, the government steps in, as it has in the last 20 years, and controls the situation by paying capacity fees to guarantee the solvency of all generators. Well, that's already starting to happen. That money is to, for plants to stand by and deliver nothing until the short few hours that they're needed. And uh, this is really just a subsidy, a subsidy that will have to be paid in perpetuity. And the bottom line is, this is the cost that consumers will end up paying. Another factor that really puts the pay to, to the viability of the ISP is the uh, fact that AMO and the regulators have already begun a demand-side participation scheme at both the wholesale uh, uh, business level and the, and the retail level of consumers and residential level which is an Orwellian system of command and control. Everyone in the future 
given the fact that the technical standards uh, uh, specification was adopted a, a year ago, so that all new solar uh, uh, installations on residences will have to be Wi-Fi enabled and connected to a control center of some kind. Now, this will monitor homes when there is energy shortages, as there inevitably will be, and it will turn off your hot water heater. It will turn off your air conditioner. It will turn off your, your heater during the winter. Um, if you have an electric vehicle in the garage being charged up overnight, as 95% of the EV owners have recently uh, stated, then that will be turned off too, because that's the biggest consumer of electricity in the future for any home. And if you have a residential battery, that's going to be drained into the uh, grid to support a failing grid design. This is, uh, uh, this ISP is a recipe for sh uh, energy shortages. It's not a plan to deliver what consumers need when they need it. And final point is on national security. As uh, people have already mentioned this morning, 90% uh, of our renewables, wind turbines, solar panels, batteries, originate with China. And when it uh, controls the, the global markets to the extent it does, we are basically taking a current, reliable, domestic grid, <coughs> operates independently, and putting ourselves at a complete dependency of another country, which has already logged trade sanctions against us. And I have to just leave you with the one question, how sustainable is that? Well, that's uh, my remarks for this morning. Thank you very much. Thanks, James. Um, it's David, David Collins. Come on down. Um, David Collins is coming now. Dave has uh, had a long history of engineering in many fields, and you've all seen his CV. Um, he has done some economic analysis. We got a snippet of it yesterday. Uh, but Dave, if you'd like to come down now with your presentation. Sure. Guys, we're getting towards the end. Thank you so much. Uh, as another engineer, it's to be. Oh, sure. I'm sorry. As as another engineer, I can uh, just say this on behalf of all engineers that public speaking is not one of our great skills. Uh, certainly not one of mine. Um, but the reason why you've got so many engineers here is they have a lot of special knowledge, and uh, it's time that we did start mm -hmm. speaking because otherwise we're going to be going down the wrong path. So I'm going to do my bit. Uh, and to start with, uh, let me, uh, let me, I'd like to pick up on some of the stuff that we talked about yesterday. Um, but also what I'd like to do too is talk a little bit about some of the future in a more upbeat. There's been a lot of sort of, let's call it downbeat stuff and I'm an optimistic kind of guy, so I just needed to find something and I hope you'll see this in this, in this discussion. So, I'm going to talk about these things here, and this is based upon, uh, in fact, the uh, the study that that uh, Dr. Dave uh, had uh, had talked about earlier, in, in the trip of the Daves and the Robs to uh, to the U.S. And uh, and one of the things that we did is we visited MIT and we spent a few days there and heard from some of the smartest people in the room. Um, and uh, and I'd like to share some of those points with you because it is some wonderful upbeat uh, opportunities for us here in Australia. Okay, guys, we're behind time, so uh, listen quickly. Um, so here's some of the folks that, uh, that I'd like to just say I'm indebted to, um, and I'm going to refer to their work. Um, there's some more details here, and, and deep, which, uh, web links and so on, but they're not material. This is material. So yesterday I talked about AEMO. This is a schematic that I've copied from AEMO's uh, 2022 uh, June report. And on the left-hand side is what I call the explicit costs that they've uh, mentioned at $383 billion uh, to get to uh, 2050 net zero. What they didn't mention is the cost of the right-hand side, which is in fact controlled by the Orwellian system. 
of, uh, of Wi-Fi that uh, James aptly uh, described. And the cost of that, I've estimated, this is my number so you can blame me, is $240 billion, all up to $623 billion. And of course, if you allow for, say, over a 60-year period, say the life of a typical nuclear uh, plant, which, by the way, is, is probably uh, going to be more like 80 years, then the cost would be $1.2 trillion, allowing for replacement of, um, of PV cells and batteries and so on. So there's two points I want to make here. One is that the AMO does not include the implicit cost, which is the cost you and I incur with our PV cells on the roof, which AEMO are going to control. And the second point is the costs are much greater than, than they suggested for the system that they've designed. This is the cost for an equivalent uh, nuclear system based upon the UAE uh, costings with a little margin on that to allow for uh, inflation. And so, look at the simplicity, if I may. Look, compare the simplicity. This is the complex AEMO system and the control problems that we've talked about today. And this is the nuclear system. It's a much simpler control problem. It's a much simpler system and uh, requires much less uh, extraneous investment. Uh, so it's a fraction of the cost. Um, there's a number of folks at MIT have talked about some wonderful technologies, which I'll talk about in a minute. And this is the reason why we need to be uh, applying these new technologies and why we're here today, is because the trend in greenhouse gas emissions is continuing. And most of that is due to China and India. Uh, in the Western world, the emissions are reducing, whereas China and India are growing so quickly that they dominate the entire world's emissions. One of the issues we have not talked about yet today is the idea of, uh, let's call it the, um, um, uh, the, the problem that you occur, occurs when you choose a site, say for wind turbines or for solar cells, you're going to go to your best sites, your lowest cost sites first. And, and eventually, though, you're going to run into a brick wall because the, only the expensive sites are left. Uh, you know, the people who will never allow transmission on their, on their, uh, on their land and so on. And so um, we don't know where that point is. So basically, by buying into a renewable system, we're buying into a process that we can't predict the outcome of. Here's an example of the logic that follows from that. So if you can imagine, at every single level uh, of the renewable system, you have these uncertainties. Are they fully scalable? Is the transmission feasible? Can we put in storage, and is it proven and scalable? Can we control the demand response through our uh, Wi-Fi system effectively? Will the cost be acceptable? And if you follow through this logic, if you, even if you apply very conservative, say, okay, it's only 10% chance of being wrong at each point, you still got roughly a 50-50 chance that this whole, whole system won't work. And simple, and this is a sort of tool that was great to talk to folks in the street about, because hey, just think about how many steps are involved in every step. There's another risk, and you combine those risks, and your outcome becomes very risky. Jock proposed a leader at the MIT in their nuclear group, and he had a wonderful little story to tell you. Say, this is his only slide here, and it basically is this. And I'm not going to point it with a laser, but I'm going to point it with my finger. Well, it's self evident. In, in case you missed it, on the top left-hand corner, the tiny little square, that's the footprint of the nuclear facility. <laughs> no kidding. Those are rough, those, you know, pretty accurate uh, scaling. And the environmental impacts generally scale with land areas. So the environmental impacts are much smaller for nuclear. Here's an example. I, I appreciate that here in Australia we don't have any, uh, you know, power reactors. But they're common around the world. We know this. If, if you do get the question, hey, it's so dangerous well, then you, and expensive, then you say, well, gee, that's funny, because most of the world relies on nuclear. Um, now, there is one legitimate point, though, that nuclear uh, does suffer from, problem, and that's cost. And if you look on the left-hand side, this is, a, this is for different projects. These are different costs per kilowatt of installed capacity. And if you look on the left, all of the Western countries are really high costs, and all of the Eastern countries are low cost. Go figure. Now, we talked about that yesterday, and it's, it's largely um, due to, uh, I, I believe, uh, policy, and I, I, I know that MIT have done further work also in looking at what they describe as the, uh, the, uh, the project planning. 
One important aspect of project planning is the design completion percentage at construction. And as you see there on the right hand side, all of those low cost, let's call it um, uh, facilities, all have very high design completion at, at the start of construction. And the lowest cost ones, by the way, they're all the Western ones, you know, have the lowest. Why would you start a project with only 25% of your project design complete? And, and the answer is because you have to in the West because the approvals process takes so long. There's no way it makes any sense to spend a lot of money on design and wait 20 years to, and maybe never get it back again if it doesn't get approved. So what do you do? You wait until you have the approval and then you start your design. And then, of course, you have a lot of other pressures to get your, you know, your cash out the door, cash in the door, and to get the process developed. Uh, here's a wonderful uh, if you like, image on the right-hand side. It shows uh, small modular reactors co-located with a coal-fired power station. Why wouldn't you do that? You co-locate the reactors there. They don't have to be small modular. They can be uh, you know, full-scale uh, nuclear facilities. But you co-locate them with the, with the coal fire station. And then in 10 years' time, when your coal station is being decommissioned, you turn on your nuclear when you turn off your coal. You use the same transmission lines. You use the same labor workforce in the surrounding area. Your electorate loves you because they don't lose jobs. And they get high-paying jobs just like they had in the coal system. Now, this is the big... Uh, the biggest thing I'm going to talk about. This is a really, really exciting bit. I will not go into detail here, but suffice it to say, MIT seems to have uh, figured out how to do uh, fusion. This is a fusion reactor being constructed as we speak near Boston. It's funded by uh, Bill Gates and some other wealthy individuals. $1.5 billion is the only cost. For those of you who are familiar, who's familiar with ITER, I-T-E-R reactor? Right, a lot of the folks in the room. Well, this is a tiny, tiny fraction of the ITER costs. And that's what MIT have done. They've developed the ability to miniaturize the fusion process instead of having these massive uh, facilities. And uh, I'm not, you know, you know the old saying about fusion, it's 30 years away, and it always will be. Now, what I'm told is it is about 25 years away, and it always will be. So it's less. It's less. <laughs> uh, but having said that, you know, in a few years' time, we're going to see this up and up, up and going. We'll, we'll have this uh, theory tested. By the way, these guys have got a, a capacity to work quickly that I haven't seen anywhere else. They published a paper in 2021 with a theory behind this new technology, and right now, today, they've already broken ground and they've got the facility uh, being constructed. Wow, we couldn't. Wouldn't it be awesome if we could do that? And I wanted to ask Helen about that. It's, I, mean, I don't know how they manage a legal process there, but they definitely did something magical. Okay, the other point I'd like to make is that we talked a little bit about uh, SMRs, and it's not just SMRs. It's the entire sort of uh, field of uh, nuclear technology has been neglected for the last few generations, simply because of this hiatus. In, in, uh, in approvals, and so I, I just wanted to say, if we choose to go with nuclear in Australia, then we not only open up an opportunity for energy, but for extraordinary technology development and a, a way, you know, new new discoveries that we can only dream of. Uh, here's an example of just some of the sort of, uh, I guess, these uh, small modular reactors and related facilities that research facilities that are uh, that are being proposed. There's one there, I'll point out, Hitachi, uh, BWR, about 2028 and a half. Uh, that one's going in in, um, in Ontario, in Canada. Community attitudes. Have you guys seen this face of this man? What a hero. What a hero. Honestly, we really need to, as, a, as an industry, need to recognize this guy. And, and I, I'd be wonderful if we can get him here to speak to Parliament. <coughs> um, see that protesters in the background? Look at that sign. It's in Finland. <laughs> no kidding. Okay, conclusions. Um, we've got a real opportunity here to make a difference. Um, and it's not a difference for Australia, it's a difference for the world. So um, clearly we have to stop messing around with Australia. We need to get Australia done quickly. We can do this in nuclear, make some decisions now. It takes some time to implement. But we can make the decisions now lock in nuclear as Australia's solution, and then we can start helping the rest of the world in supplying technology, supplying 
uh, labor, supplying services, supplying equipment that we can uh, manufacture here in Australia to help the rest of the world. It's not about Australia. Wouldn't we look stupid if we f solved Australia's problem and the rest of the world was still pumping out the other 99% of the emissions? Um, the other point I just wanted to make here is that, uh, is that I think that ultimately we have to get this change to policy uh, and, and regulation in order to have a, an open debate about this. Um, we haven't had the chance to do so yet. And, um, and I'm hoping that can happen very quickly. And just to finish on um, another Winston Churchill uh, comment, I'm not sure if he said exactly this, but let me try and frame, reframe it as if he was here. So nuclear is the best form of energy, full stop. Thank you. <laughs>
So this system is not looking particularly good. Now, I, I stress that with my modelling, what I model is cost. I don't, I don't model price. I'm not an economist. All I can do is cost the things that go into it. Um, I think the, uh, the price and this sort of system, I think a dollar per kilowatt hour is not out of the question. You know, like it's getting seriously, seriously uh, uh, non-functional system. We've got a system that's bouncing right up. And, you know, some people might say, well, we can use this excess energy to make hydrogen. Well, how difficult would that be? Because um, on two days here, this top part here is what I call spillage. This is... A, this is uh, solar generation and wind generation that we can't use because we either the storage is already full uh, or we don't have the megawatt capacity to transfer it from where it's been generated in the solar farm to where it could be used. So, you know, using this for hydrogen generation, we, we could do okay on this day maybe, we could probably do okay on this day, but what about these three days in the middle, you know, with the sun a bit, of, a bit more cloud? How can you build a plant, a hydrogen plant, that can function in that sort of environment? I just don't think it's going to be economically viable. Um, the, this, the previous slide was a winter slide. In summer, we've got the same sort of issues. The cost is still 63 cents a kilowatt hour. We've got our system bouncing around. Uh, and uh, this is a very, very difficult and unstable system to run. I wouldn't like to be the system control engineer that has to put all that together. What might nuclear look like? What we do with nuclear, if we're able to run it, is just run across the bottom. We just run the base load. And uh, what, what, what we could use, what we use in this system is, is our solar up here uh, with our storages, where it's, it's quite good at fitting that top part. And the point I want to stress is that it's the mix. We need a, a very viable mix of generation sources to get the best outcome. It's not just solar, it's not just nuclear. It's the, it's the right engineering mix that will give us the best outcome. And when I run that model with uh, reasonable uh, pricing, with reasonable cost inputs, we're running at about 27 cents a kilowatt hour, which is roughly what we're paying at the moment. So I think we could, uh, we could do very well with this system. Now, why is the renewable system so expensive? It's not necessarily the solar plants, and we've, we've, uh, we've seen the levelised cost of energy uh, being put forward by other presenters for wind and solar being quite reasonable levels. One of the big issues is transmission. Now, I've got, I've got, a couple of, I've got two simple diagrams just to illustrate what happens with transmission. Uh, and I'll just use an example. I've got Sydney here. The big load in New South Wales will be Sydney. And on the uh, northern coal fields up here in the Hunter Valley, we've got uh, Liddell, Araring, we've got their big power stations. And we've got a very strong connection from uh, the power stations into the city. Out in the west, we've got uh, Dubbo. And Dubbo is a really nice place um, where the zoo is. And uh, <laughs> there's a link out there that will supply power out to Dubbo. We've got Canberra. Of course, Canberra is very important, data, the centre of the world. Um, and, uh, with a modest type link because, you know, Canberra is a substantial load. And we've got our snowy hydro down at the bottom. Now, when we move forward in, in, a, in a scheme like the uh, integrated system plan we're suggesting that we do, this is what happens. What happens is that uh, uh, our hunter, our coal-fired plants are shut down, and so uh, we run the risk of these lines here becoming uh, redundant or underutilised. Our, our Sydney load is not going to go away. We, we build a renewable energy zone out of Dubbo, Instead of having a, a single weak link, we need to have this very, very strong link because in the middle of the day, we need to be able to transfer all that power that we're generating from our uh, renewable sources from Dubbo, our renewable energy zone, into the city. So we have to build these extra lines that I've shown there in pink. But there's more. If you should remember that the generation went above the black line. We have to be able to get the excess from uh, Dubbo into storage. Where's our storage? Snowy 2.0. So we need to build brand new lines and transmission down here to, um, to Snowy 2.0. To, to Snowy, uh, and uh, this is all very expensive and, and brand new. And, but again, there's more. What, there's the more. The more is we've got to get power from Snowy 2.0 to Canberra, <laughs> to Sydney, during the evening when the sun goes down. So you can see that what starts off with low cost generation ends up with this massive cost of transmission. But there's more costs. Um, that's, not, that's not the end of it. Now, if I look at our at existing power system, what we look at the moment, uh, 
if I have a, this is the conventional power station, we have transmission, uh, we have uh, distribution, which is sub-transmission here, and our low voltage, and I've got our customers, our little houses over here on the right, on the right hand side. This is what we, this is what we've conventionally run. And, uh, but when we go forward, this is what happens. When we build a renewable energy system, what we have to do is we build our solar farm. This is out at Dubbo, this is at Armadale. Um, uh, we have to augment our transmission system. So I, where I just had one transmission system before, I've now built transmission to here. I've got to build transmission to here, to my pump storage, to my storage down here. And uh, so this, this slide also just reflects what the previous slide shows. So there's a big increase in um, costs for transmission. We've got our sub-transmission through here. Now, if you go to the integrated system plan, they're putting 68 gigawatts of solar on people's roofs. 68 gigawatts. See, I've got the solar here on these roofs. If I go back to the uh, to the previous slide, we just had four houses that were connected to one low voltage system. When we go to the integrated system plan, I've got to put 68 gigawatts. Now, 68 gigawatts is double the load of the existing system. Can you imagine? I don't think there'll be enough roof space on the, in Australia to put that number of uh, solar cells on. But if we were able to do it, it's not just building the solar cells and putting the batteries in. There's a, this, this particular house has got solar and batteries. We've got to augment the distribution network, this part here, this, the 11 kV part and the 230 volts part. Now, I work in this distribution space. If you think it's expensive to build this stuff up here at the transmission level, you should see how expensive it is to build this part down here. To push one megawatt down through low voltage, you can spend $100,000 and connect 10 houses, 20 houses. It's just incredibly expensive. Now, where does the ISP go with this? The ISP, when they do their costing, what they do is they calculate the net present value of this expenditure over here. They, they pick up the, uh, the solar and wind generation, they pick up the new transmission, they pick up the big batteries, the big solar batteries, and away it goes. They, what they don't do is they don't pick up this part over here. And I suspect that this part here is just as big as this part over here. So, and I think Dave uh, Collins had uh, some numbers on that. Um, I think that with the ISP, what we're only seeing is half the probably about half the cost of what it will be to, uh, to, uh, to deliver. How do I do it? With my modelling, what I do is, I don't just look at the costing at the metre to the delivered uh, uh, power to a particular customer. What we have to do is move inside to the power point because this particular house has got solar and its batteries. Does it seem logical that if you're going to build a, a new power system that you would include the cost of the rooftop solar and the batteries that would come with it, it's only logical that you would include it. With the ISP, all that is totally neglected. And what we need to do is get them to look at the delivered cost to the power point. Now, being the communicator that I am, I've been communicating with AEMO on this, and um, I've put forward a proposal to do this for them, and um, I'm still waiting for the returned phone call and the, uh, and the order number. I'm looking forward to the order number. <laughs> so where, where is this leading us? If you, look at, if you look at delivered energy costs, electricity costs around the world, uh, this is Costa down here. This, these are various countries that I've selected. There's Australia sitting there. We're sitting there at about 30 cents a kilowatt hour. If you look at other countries, <coughs> you've got uh, Canada, where, where uh, we've just been, at about 15. This is, this is going back to uh, uh, 2021. Half, half the cost. Um, we've got uh, South Korea uh, in, a, in a similar vein. So these are countries that, um, that I, look, I look toward because my career has been about providing low-cost, reliable electricity to customers. I'm actually shattered with what's happening at the moment because it just goes completely against what I've been trying to do all my career. So this is where I want to go. Um, do I want to go in the German route? See Germany here with their uh, push toward renewables? There's the 30 cent mark. We're looking up toward the 45 and 50 cents. I suspect now it's probably over here in the uh, off, off my scale. Uh, so this is, where, this is where we have to go. We have to really think through what we're doing and what we're doing at the moment is not working. 
So I'm going to hand at this point to Rob Parker, who's going to finish it off. Okay. Okay. So you've now got a delivery from a grey-haired, bearded engineer with glasses. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm going to go quite quickly here. So taking Robert's model, we then put a comparison of, and we've, we've seen a number of these comparisons. Steve Wilson's done well with some, and Tony Irwin's also put comparisons up. And so all these various comparisons we're looking at are heading in a similar direction. Uh, what this image is intended to show is on the left hand vertical scale, we have the cents per kilowatt hour. That's the measure. What we have along the horizontal scale are six different systems of energy provision. And so the blue, well that represents the generation cost of each of those systems. The orange, that's the incremental increase to high voltage customers. Sydney Trains, or one of our big uh, energy users at an industrial boat. And then what we've got up top is the cost of the provision of electricity to mums and dads. Over on the left, we've got our current system, our current NEM system. And that, on a cost basis, not a price, a cost basis, is providing electricity at a total cost to mums and dads of circa 23 cents. That's cost. To that you would add retail and therefore QED we get up to around the 32 cents retail. If we go to one of the integrated system plan models, in this case the hydrogen one, we'll only worry about the top numbers, 52 cents, more than double. If we go to the step change scenario, we're at 51 cents to mums and dads. If we come to a less aggressive approach under the integrated system plans, that are the progressive model, that's the fourth one along, well, mums and dads are going to pay 42 cents for that. If we go to a nuclear scenario with about 43% nuclear penetration, we're at um, 30, and then on the, other, on the final one, we've got 25. Now, We've taken that previous graph and we've looked at what's, what's the payola in terms of emissions reductions. Because that's the reason we're meant to be in this game, otherwise we continue with that coal burning. Well, we've calibrated on the far left, that's our existing system, we're up at about 693 uh, grams of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour. That's about where we're at. So the system's working. When we go to the hydrogen one, where well, we get to 47, when we go to the step change, we're at 107 because they've still got a fair amount of gas in the system. We go to the progressive, we're at 158. These are not low carbon situations. We go to the nuclear, we start to inject nuclear, we get down to 89 and finally, on the right hand side, we're down around the 16 when you put a lot of nuclear into your system. Why is a little bit, why are small amounts of nuclear, have, do they have a cost problem where large amounts of nuclear don't? That's what these two images are intended to show. On the bottom left, we see where we've got 43% nuclear with wind, solar, gas, hydro, batteries and pump storage, okay? So Kumbaya has taken over here, we're all going to be friends and life's going to be good, except it's not. The problem is that when you try to play nice with renewables with nuclear, you get a disrupted system where the capacity factors of those nuclear plants go down, which drives up their operating cost. And with all that amount of renewables, you have still got the compounding cost of the increased transmission. So you're getting hit both ways by an inefficiency by trying to blend two systems which do not match. Up on the top right, we see the situation with a simpler system where you've got nuclear as the dominant form, and that's up around 78%. People think, wow, that's a lot. Well, it is a big challenge, and I put numbers up yesterday which are indicative of the kinds of gigawatts 
that we need to be putting into a system to achieve that. But look how simple it is. We've got solar in the day, we've got a bit of storage, we've got a current hydro working, and that is quite a controllable and readily operable system. We look briefly, and we've gone through this uh, in my previous presentation and Tony's presentations, we've looked at a number of different types of nuclear power plants which will be evolving. So um, I think the most relevant part out of this particular slide is to look at that top left hand tabulation where as we inject more and more demand into the system under the proposed energy increases in demand on the NEM, we see an incremental growth in the amount of nuclear power that would be required at the same proportion. So we go from about 24 gigawatts on the far right to 35 to 47. It's all demand driven. In conclusion, rushing to failure, rushing to failure with 100% wind and solar is not an option. The integrated plans based on renewables are creating stranded and poorly performing investments. That will drive inflation and that will be a massive cost to us. Our grid supply needs to be planned for a century, not just the near term. We need an optimum mix of all generator types. We've got to be disciplined about the mix uh, to achieve a low cost, low carbon generation. And finally, analysis from MIT Australia and the International Energy Association tells us there will be no net zero without nuclear energy. Thank you. Dorian von Freyhold down there. Dorian um, runs Compass Polling, which has the most advanced polling techniques uh, in the Australian context. And he's been following issues around um, nuclear energy attitudes, so on and so forth. Uh, so he brings a, a much more granular insight to what Australians are thinking. And I'd like him to come forward and give us his presentation. And I think we're going to get Warren Mundine to join us again. So uh, a bit of a step change. Um, we've, we've, heard, we've heard a lot about engineering so far, and um, I think that is at least 50% of the challenge. Uh, if we think about how to get nuclear in as part of a mix, the other part is selling it to the populace. And, and you know, having sat through this morning and, and quietly up there after a couple of coffees, I know as somebody who interacts a lot with the public and gets a lot of public opinions that we've probably put 99% of people to sleep. Um, with the numbers, with the engineering. And I have to say, I'm, I'm an undergrad engineer, probably the lousiest engineer in here. Um, but what I do understand a lot about is um, how do you elicit what people's thinking is? How do you elicit how to communicate them in a way that will change their mind and persuade them? So my, my background is a PhD in consumer psychology. We're going to have a few numbers and big graphs up here. So uh, it's probably a bit of the, um, the, the light program for the day. Now, what we did and have been doing over the last year is regularly going out to the public and asking them questions uh, about energy, about prices, about nuclear, um, as, well, and as well as other technologies. So we have some tracking data. The samples, and I'll just cover the sample really quickly. Uh, every time there was a sample of 1,000 people, nationally representative of the Australian population, as per the census, it's just one question that always comes up. So I'll, I'll get that out of the way. So it passes the pub test. It's beyond statistically significant. You're looking at results that are plus minus 2.5% uh, from, from where the, the general populace will be. So we'll start out with a couple of questions that are more on energy policy and, and prices. So not quite nuclear yet, and then we'll move into, into nuclear. This polling is exclusive polling. You're the, the first people to see this. It's about a week old, um, so for your, for your eyes. So the first question we have, it's a very simple question. We're asking people to trade off. If you could only have one or the other, would you offer affordable or renewable electricity? Now, what you can see off the bat is people are hip pocket sensitive. They are hip pocket sensitive and quite so. And we'll, we'll continue to unpack this. But this may already be a surprise. It is no foregone conclusion that everybody wants renewables and they'll go at it at whatever price it costs them. The second one here, the government says that increasing the amount of wind and solar will decrease energy prices. Do you agree? 53% of people... Uh, 
agree, which is somewhat concerning. But if you think about the narrative, if you think about uh, what, what uh, Bowen is saying, falsely, and we know, but the average Joe doesn't have a PhD in, in engineering, and you know, pro probably isn't all that interested either, there is a strong narrative and a strong media push towards um, having us believe that renewables are the cheapest form of electricity out there. And there's something so intuitive about that, something, something that just gels, you know, it's sun, it's wind, you have course, you can harness it, and then it's cheap. Um, but as you know, there are a lot of wrinkles in that narrative. Uh, but that, that doesn't stop Bowen from just going, going and confidently and loudly saying these things and, and getting away with it. So we are seeing that the um, general population is to an extent influenced by that. And in some of the tracking research I'll show you, you can see the trend. Now another really important one, by how much would you tolerate the cost of electricity going up before it must become the top priority for the government to get under control? 25%. Is, is the average for the population. Now, if you think of Chalmers, the, the budget, he's already saying, oh, you know, it could go up by 56%. So that's already doubled where people will start jumping up and down, you know, get out of their pitchforks and flares. So 25%, we can see people already smarting. They, they do not accept electricity at, at any price. And we're not even touching on reliability or any of those issues. At the moment, it's just price. And if you think about it, the electricity debate, much of the technology is an input. The output, what your average person sees, is their energy bill. And it is one of the few policy areas where you do have a direct communication with the general populace in a way that really speaks to them. You know, it's the hip pocket, it's the dollar amount on their, their energy bill. And that will probably only start to bite in about a year when we do see those, um, those energy price increases for the consumer hit. Uh, but that poses a huge opportunity, as we'll get to in a second. Another one here. <laughs> we ran this a day after the budget, so, so David complimented us on being the, the most sophisticated outfit when it comes to polling. Part of that is speed, so within 24 to 48 hours we can turn around polling and get into the media. A bit of the race is who's, who's the fastest when it comes to the budget. We were out with these results 24 hours after the budget, took news, uh, news poll, I think 10 days. Um, so one of the government's election <laughs> promises was a $275 decrease in everyday Australians' annual electricity bill. Treasurer Jim Chalmers has now warned Australians to raise their energy price hikes up to 56%. Do you think the government should apologise for the broken election promise? A lot of people are annoyed. No, of course we didn't get the promise. We were never going to get a promise. Uh, no, apology, sorry. Um, but you know, what you can see is people aren't just accepting of it. Yeah, they're not. They're not. They're not happy. They're not happy. Even if you have a look at these results by party breakdown, Labor Party voters. I think the numbers were 70% wanted an apology as well. <laughs> Um, so it is a pain point. Now you've got the media starting to cotton on, and, and this was an article, I think it came out two days ago, uh, 20, the 22nd, um, about origin. Rising energy bills may derail green transition. It was a statement from the CEO of, uh, of origin saying that renewables are going to lead to increases in energy prices. Again, think of what Bowen's saying, the, the direct opposite. Now he can, you know, Bowen can run with that narrative um, as long as energy prices haven't gone up, when they do, um, there is an opportunity to strike. So that, that, that narrative of pricing is starting to shape up. Of course, Origin is under a lot of pressure with Brookfield coming in, investing heavily, trying to, trying to push towards renewables. You've got the same with AGL, they have the whole Cannon Brooks thing now and a new board and a push. Uh, so the retailers are becoming sensitive, and they get a lot of um, consumer feedback as well. Are they not stupid? They analyze their data and they can see that consumers are getting pretty jumpy. I they get a lot of complaints as well. Um, so in a, in a way, as a consumer-sensitive organization, a shareholder-sensitive organization, they're getting direct market feedback. Now to, to nuclear and a few questions that, that inform uh, uh, where everyday Australians are on the, on the nuclear topic. First of all, do you think Australia should explore nuclear power as an option for meeting our energy security emissions targets? Um, yeah, pretty much the... Uh, the money question here. Um, now, we have one uh, time slide here, September 2021, AUKUS had just been declared. That was, that was at the height of, of people's general sentiment towards nuclear. And, and uh, I haven't got the data up here, but we could see that you know, once the subs, and most people were behind the subs, 75% of Australians were behind the subs, once people were accepted, accepted subs, it was a natural transition for them to think, okay, nuclear energy, um, is probably the way forward as well. 
Now that has petered off, and there hasn't been that much uh, about nuclear in the media since. And we can see that you know, the, you know, things are shifting against nuclear. Now that's probably just complacency. Or, you know, it's not selling stories for the media at the moment. And that's something we need to work on. But we can see November, so, so a week ago, um, we were down to 57% of people uh, thinking that we should entertain it. So that's a 12% drop. That's very significant. Now, back to sort of the narrative around affordability, what would make uh, most convince you that Australians should transition to small-scale nuclear power plants as part of the energy mix? Again, we can see hip pocket comes up trumps. Uh, number one, proof that it will make electricity affordable. Uh, number two is um, emissions targets, 2050 emissions targets. Number three is again something that's pretty practical, proof that will enable Australia to be self-reliant when it comes to energy. As we know, and as, as we've seen today, plenty of the other technologies won't necessarily rely, uh, enable us to be self-reliant. Number four, proof it is a more reliable source of electricity, no blackouts, and reliability, which is an area that you know, there has been a bit of a media attempt to get a narrative going that isn't going to find out well, and the other ones, you know, jobs and, and uh, less obtrusive, disappointingly low. I had hopes for those, but uh, I often get my predictions wrong on this anyway. Um, now, this one's interesting because it starts to look at what kind of uh, technology people want. So research suggests that renewable energy needs to be supplemented by an always-on electricity generating, generating technology like coal or gas or nuclear to ensure affordable around the crop supply. How do you think Australia should supplement intermittent renewable energy generation? Again, we can see the same worrying trend. You know, started off, off strong September 2021, 50% of folks were saying transition to nuclear. Um, again, we're not really talking a mix here. We're trying to get sort of an idea of what happens if you give people polar opposites. Then uh, continue with coal and gas. Most people in 2021 were off that idea. Um, and 36% said transition to 100% renewables. What's happened since, and you can see it's a somewhat gradual transition. Yeah, in part, we've already seen increases in energy costs by uh, April 2022, and coal and gas increased by a fair amount. You know, an, an interesting increase there. Otherwise, uh, renewables is kind of tracking along. You've always got those who want to go hold as bolus, and nuclear had already taken a bit of a hit by that stage. And that trend has sort of continued, but you can see the, uh, uh, the Chalmers and, and Bowen narratives starting to bite in that now more and more people are, are starting to believe transition to 100% renewables is the way forward. Now, those numbers aren't nice, but there's something really encouraging here. And that is that within six months, you can sway public opinion to a significant extent. So the idea that folks are rusted onto a single idea and they're not going to transition away from that is untrue. And that, that is, in a way, a call to arms to pick up our game when it comes to the counter-narrative. You know, it's really important. And you know, Again, that, that argument I showed you early on was one of the very few that spoke about energy costs in the media. There isn't a lot about that at the moment, let alone you know, trying to compare. I know it's complex, and you, you, you really can't get too complex. I'm often enough with stories, it boils down to a yes, no, and that's what the average reader will digest. But you, you have to start communicating uh, what the true costs are going to be. Now, that can't be disproven immediately, and, and Bowen um, and, and Chalmers will probably downplay it, but reality will strike in, you know, let's say, six months, a year, two years, and then you can say, I told you so, and point back. Otherwise, they'll come up with a bunch of excuses. Ukraine and whatever else. Um, now, how would you describe your attitude to nuclear energy? Um, so, you know, off the bat, you can see there's twice as many uh, anti-nuclear folks as pro-nuclear, but really encouraging is that the 60% of people are still undecided. You know, that's, that's fertile hunting ground. You know, that's, that's where you start persuading, and you can see from that previous slide that those people will swing. You know, that's a debate that if managed well, managed well by the media, managed well by politicians, can have a significant impact on public opinion. Just looking at this by party, is also rather interesting. I mean, sure, you, you kind of know what people on the, on the right think. Uh, and I'd just like to focus your attention here on, on the left side. 
uh, so greens, you know, what, what can you see there off the bat? Support is probably higher than you would have thought for nuclear or undecidedness. And uh, uh, Addy has spoken previously about the, the Finnish greens. And you probably find that within the greens, there are two camps. There's the, the young, progressive, modern greens, and they are embracing nuclear. And we can see that trend in Europe, you know, protests for, for go nuclear. Um, but even the, um, the ones in between, you know, there's a lot of undecideds there too. And this has been a trend that it, it's not recent. We picked up on that even one and a half years ago when we started this endeavor. Now, there's, there's one more slide, and given we've got a bit of extra time, I wasn't going to show you this, but we started out this journey in polling thinking that, you know, there are probably a lot of problems with public perception of nuclear, and one of the major ones may well be safety concerns. Um, and since we've seen, even the left is running with the safety concerns one, but we ran a, a number of studies uh, which were focused at figuring out how close people would want to live to certain uh, necessary, panhedonic, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but sort of ugly industries, right? Now, of course, we've got brothels on the one hand. People want to be 50 k's away from a brothel, which is still worse than any of the other stuff, right? So, no, that's <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, We've got a crematorium. You know, they, they, they don't really like the idea of that too close. Drug rehab should be a long way away. Sewage processing. Now, now it gets interesting. Even then, they wanted a coal-fired power plant about as far away as a nuclear power plant. Plan. And, and that's, and again, the numbers aren't up here, but we did find that there's a lot of support for the idea of getting rid of the old coal-fired power plants and bombing in a nuclear power plant there. That is a palatable idea that flies. Now, this is, this is kind of interesting. The next cut is how close, you know, just Australia being an island and a little bit backward when it comes to perceptions around nuclear, I think we're all on that same page. How close are other places to nuclear? And when you see New York has got their closest one, 54 k's away. Uh, London, 59. Paris, 79. Um, La Trobe to Melbourne is 136. That's a cold example. Upper Hunter, uh, 145. So we're kind of working for the nuclear side um, on a very safe scenario for Australians. I'm sure we have plenty of room to, to put those, those power plants. But of course, a uh, problem there will be transmission of the power. So yeah, there, there are costs involved in that. And then I, I finally wanted to show you the average Sydney side as reality when it comes to a lot of those. <laughs> um, but, so I'll admit, this isn't average, so this is me. And, and uh, I, I know that Helen lives about two k's away from me um, as of today. And you can see that there's a lot of stuff awfully close by. And that is, again, an indicator of reality. You know, you might not like the idea of being there, but, you know, essentially to, to live the modern lives that we want to live, you have to put up with these things. Which is the, the end of the presentation um, for today, but what, what I can offer, and we run a lot of polling, we, every week we're out there with questions, um, so if there are any, any ideas that you have, please email me and we can run them as polls. Also when it comes to the communication um, of nuclear to the public, I think this is really just scratching the surface of what could be done and, and what I want to um, really emphasize here is the importance of getting the framing right. Because if we go down rabbit holes of, of technology, rabbit holes of small numbers and long narrative, we lose most people. Uh, that's, that's just how it works. Most people don't, you know, it's, it's not a big issue until they see high power prices and they're just going to look for the, the closest culprit, the closest person to blame. And that's, that's where the opportunity lies. We have to make sure that the closest person to blame is the, the current government. And the narrative has to start as soon as possible, otherwise you're going to lose that. Uh, prices will go up, they'll blame somebody else, we haven't done the groundwork to be able to blame them for it, and the opportunity is lost. Well, uh, in the absence of anyone joining us, we might get our panel going, uh, Stephen. Um, so, some of us, uh, some of your panelists, I'll let you choose which uh, ones, but I was thinking, Guy, and you stay here, and um, uh, Helen, and maybe Rob or Rob, um, and we can pass the microphone around to uh, any others, or whoever you want to have down the front. Yeah. Thanks, David. I just wanted to uh, 
frame this panel discussion up with a, just a couple of thoughts, uh, just to sort of step back from all that, that detail that we've just been through. Yeah, so I, I think, you know, we, we've been, I was born in 68, you know, we've, we've, we've been through half a century plus of perceptions and, and, you know, we've just seen this like little snapshot from Dorian about the way people perceive things. And, and this is like a little bit of sharing actually from me from before I was born and afterwards of things that influenced my thinking, you know, Rick over on the left at the, the moon landing and then the oil shocks at Three Mile Island and Chernobyl and uh, the, the, um, the Rainbow Warrior incident in Auckland Harbour and then the market reform era and then this kind of, there was this renaissance and excitement in the 2000s and then Fukushima came. So there's a real sort of journey of perception there. And then laying on that, the actual growth, the, the enormous acceleration of growth, and then the sort of leveling off of the industry actually looked like that. And, you know, after Fukushima, um, it was actually George Monbiot in The Guardian, just like days, up, 11 days after the, the Fukushima, George Monbiot left, you know, so green left guy in the Guardian in the UK said, actually, Fukushima made me stop worrying and love nuclear power, which 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 I didn't find till years later. And I, I came to the same conclusion, but it took me years, and it only took George eleven days, which is pretty amazing. So I just want to just to remind ourselves, you know, this is ten percent of of generation. That's the history of the growth of the industry there, and that's how much is under construction. And we're sort of, we're on the cusp of a new era that's probably like a century long, and then maybe fusion will come later. But just, just, to, just to remember, so the first person who's going to turn 80 in the year 2100, that little baby's already been born. And nuclear power plants can operate for 80 years. So the question, so I just wanted to use Peter's question um, that he framed up in, in, in the Ford to our report. <laughs> You know, we can never find the right answers till we address the right questions. So I wanted to start by asking the panel, and I might start with Dorian, are we addressing the right questions? Um, yeah, I, as to addressing the right question, I, or questions, I, I think it's really important to ask the question of, are they the same questions for all people? And, and as I alluded to earlier, I think that the question, they're engineering questions, and, and they're really for a select small audience and that needs to be sorted by the experts and we've got plenty of experts in this room and then there are the questions that need to be answered for your average Joe for your average everyday Australian who has a busy job a family a thousand things on their mind and then they get that whopping electricity bill and they don't want to hear most of the answers you have they just want a solution and so, so I, I think you're know, really framing in your own mind, you know, what, what is an internal challenge and what is a population challenge and making sure that um, what is, is being communicated to the public really hits the mark and hits them in the right spot. And, and again, it's that hip pocket. You, know, you hit them with a the hip pocket, that's where it hurts. And that's where you build your narrative. Could, could I ask Dorian just one question on the yeah, polling? Yeah, go on. Um, Dorian, could you tell us please how you poll and how many, what is your sampling number? Yeah, so the, that's, a, that's a good question. And it, um, the way that we sample and, and compass polling is the, the political side of what we do because that doesn't mix well with the commercial side of what we do, which is uh, commercial market research under a different company. So um, what all the, uh, the large FMCGs, retailers use, as well as all the pollsters um, by now, not, not, not even Roy Morgan is there doing telephone polling anymore, is online consumer panels. Um, there are two large players in Australia, Dynana and Pure Profile. Between them, they have something like 800,000 people who are prepared to take surveys for money. Now, you might ask, does that stack up if you're paying people to take um, surveys for money with general public sentiment? And it stacks up incredibly well. And in fact, better than any other way of, of collecting data um, other than telephones to an extent. Now, the, the, the thing is that if you go out as a journalist and ask people, you know, oh, what do you think about nuclear? They're going to self-censor because it's a, it's a topic that is on the nose for most folks. You know, they don't want to be ostracized. Every, everybody's very scared of being ostracized. So you will never get a true reflection. Now, the beauty of online polls is that as folks sitting at their computer, 
and they can express without fear their opinions. So what you see here is probably much closer than any, any other journalist could really get at without doing polling. And then and again, I know that there are a few people here who either have journalist contacts or we also work with journalists, and we encourage more public opinion polling because it's so important to get um, everyday Australians' opinions into the media instead of journalists who, who live in something like 15 postcodes in Australia, very small. Oh, uh, the samples are a thousand people, um, which is, is large. Again, um, as, as I said early on, yeah, that, that's, that gives you very representative solid results. So Dorian, listening to your presentation a moment ago and, and just thinking about your answer to this question, I mean, you, you're always asking sort of ordinary people randomly sampled and you're asking these very sort of carefully framed uh, questions that are trying to get to the nub of something. And it just occurs to me that um, that, that needs to be done very skillfully and, and we need people like you to help us with that, I think. But Helen, I'm going to just uh, turn to you because I think when, when we're in this building or when we're in the boardroom, uh, of companies, um, we also need to be thinking about the right questions and the way we ask questions and the way we frame them. So Helen, from your experience, uh, obviously here in this building, but also in equivalent places around the world, um, what do you think we need to do in, in, in order to ask the right questions in those settings uh, to, to advance on that, uh, on that level? I might not be this is on? Yeah. I might not be answering your question directly, but um, I was going to chime in and say I lived overseas for 13 years before I moved back to Australia at the start of the pandemic. And I was often uh, the only woman in the room. Uh, I did a lot of work in the Middle East. I lived in the Middle East. I was often the only woman in the room, but I was also usually the only Australian in a room talking about nuclear energy. And I would often get the question of why is Australia anti-nuclear? And... I profess I really didn't know the answer, but I prattle off the standard, you know, things that I was told is why Australians are anti-nuclear. But to me, that undecided number speaks volumes to me because that, to me, seems like a true reflection of what the average person knows about nuclear, which is not much. And that was certainly what I knew about nuclear when I left Australia back in 2007. Not much. So I think it's about trying to get in the minds of Australians that, are, that there are even questions to ask and, and information to be absorbed around nuclear energy. It seems to me just to be a conversation I might have. Dave, did you want to like you? So as, as someone who works in this building and who is asked questions and who asks other people questions, it seems to me this is, this is it's the right sort of questions is what we need to get into these issues. and. and and for both sides to learn, so for the, the, the engineers and the experts and the technical people to learn what's on people's minds. Are we, are we listening? Are we learning? Are we answering their questions in the right way? Do you want to give your perspective? Yeah. Uh, we can get obsessed on value selling or benefit selling rather than asking the person, i.e. the voter, what they want. And we have definitely picked up that cost is a big driver. Your research confirms that. People are prepared to pay $5 a week, $20 a week, $50 a week. It cuts off at about 25 They don't want to spend anything more than that. That's so across the board. So how do you frame your argument in this building? Well, I'm, when we're trying to frame the arguments for it with the other side who seem to have a fairly rigid position and an official position, um, I think... The, the way to get them is to um, say, well, look, do you want to have cheap, affordable electricity and um, no risk of blackouts? And that will turn their heads. Um, whereas if you are with, say, members of the Greens Party who are quite much more emotionally linked to the anti-nuclear sentiment, it's not a sort of not, not a necessarily a rational decision, it's an emotional decision. And to get around um, the emotions that have built up over 30 years of a, equating nuclear power plants with latent, just sitting there, potential bombs, you know, you just need a terrorist to turn up or uh, a uh, event like the uh, tsunami and then we'll have bombs going off in our own territory and you just explain to them that that can't happen. So 
I think the safety thing, uh, people don't understand um, the radiation issue. They're the things that, and the, and the dollars and cents. But for politicians in this building, it's amazing what uh, concentrates the mind. And back when the market was suspended, speaking to my colleagues in New South Wales, it concentrated the minds of the biggest advocates of renewables only. They just wanted to make sure the light stayed on and that the prices didn't go up. And that's why they suspended the market and it all ordered as much coal as possible to all the coal plants and get the diesels running and the hydro going. So that's how I would frame this argument in this building now. To the Greens, it is safe, um, be a modern Green. To the Labor Party, say if you want jobs, your people are sensitive to costs. So you've got to pick your, pick your people. Just, just um, you made a great point there on price sensitivity, David, um, and I've got a good insight to share there. So, and, and then let's play a little game because it's sort of fun. This one, if you have a look at how many people tick the carbon offset box on flights, or how many people, when they pay at Coles or Woolies, decide to donate thirty-six cents or whatever to round up to a charity, um, or uh, if you have a look at energy providers, most of them have green energy plans and you can pay a bit more to get green energy. I know those plans are already there. What percentage of people do you think opt for the offset, opt for the charitable giving, opt for the green plans? If I had a pick, if I had a pick, just mostly 15%. I was going to say 20. I'd say 5 so I think on the, the electricity bill option, it's about 1%. Um, is, that, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. if we yeah. average, it'll be yeah. 2 to 3% across those three okay. options. Yeah, so, but, but I think this is, this is an interesting point you raised, Dorian, and I want to sort of, sort of springboard from that and segue into my next question. I heard somewhere um, that I think it was Qantas said that offering people that offset choice was the single biggest lever for satisfaction among their frequent flyer cohort. So, because it's like, you know, it's like $2.50 and a great green rush of happiness, I think is, is how that works. And so what, what we've been, I think we've been educating people to think, you know, this is easy, this is gonna be cheap, this won't hurt a bit, you won't feel a thing. And, and that's true from zero to 25% renewables approximately, but from 25% renewables to 100% renewables is a very different story as, as we've heard in the last couple of days. But I, w I wanted to just pick up some words from what David said and, and just get your just response to these stories. So there was, I heard um, there's something there about um, understanding, there's something there about emotion and then there's a word there about argument. And uh, so, so, so I think I, when I hear argument, I think about you know, fighting with my brother or something when I was a kid. Um, but so my question is, is this, is what we're talking about here, is it an argument, facts, logic, conclusion, Aristotle? Is it a debate or is it a discussion or some mix of all three? And what, and what do we need to learn from that? And, and again, I think we need to segment the market that we're communicating to. Um, if you go to those anti-nuclear folks, you know, you're not going to get any love there. They've, you know, they've, they've pretty much attached the religion of nuclear as a horrible thing. And you, know, it, you, you will not win that. You know, it's a waste of breath, waste of campaign money. The undecideds, that's, that's where you can have a, a discussion, a debate, and in many ways, educate them. Um, and we, we did uh, some polling and James is sitting here, he's probably got the numbers in his head around how many people feel that they know enough about nuclear and very few felt that they did. So there's, there's appetite for educa education on nuclear out there. Um, again, you have to be very uh, conscious of their ability to understand technical detail. Um, but, but I think that in that fertile hunting ground of, of undecideds, it can be an open and constructive dialogue um, where, where you're really concentrating on addressing their pain points. You know, really make sure to just focus on the simple stuff, getting the simple stuff right. 
And then for pro nuclear, I mean, it's preaching to the choir. You know, it's nice to have their support, and essentially you want them to uh, to help with a persuasive effort, uh, but that's not where you want to spend the bulk of your time. So there's a need for a conversation, and there's a need for listening, and there's a need for people to lead the conversation. Um, you know, Robert, you've been you've been doing yeoman's work for many years now through the ANA and, and subsequently uh, through Nuclear for Climate. What have you learned about the challenges of, of playing, endeavouring to play a leadership role in discussion and debate, both here in Australia and from your travels around the world? Okay, just quickly, uh, <clears throat> two methods I've been using in a dialogue with our community. We are getting an increased number of people requesting that we present to groups within, primarily New South Wales and Victoria, there's quite a number in Queensland. And people want presentation and dialogue. When I go to those, so this is a group who are looking at a whole spectrum of other issues. They may be um, looking at power bills or they may be looking at real estate prices or, or, or social justice issues. And so when you go to this disparate group and you talk about them, predominantly the, the issue that comes up over nuclear to me is that of waste. That seems to be very strong. I'm finding a significant reduction in people who have an angst over radiation. I'm not seeing people, you get the occasional one concerned about cancer, but in general, that is the ebbing. It seems to be the single greatest question is out there is, is waste. And then I get questions about cost, which, are, which enter into a discussion, but I don't get pushback. Then <clears throat> last year we ran a series of lectures, both in the Southern Highlands and New South Wales, to quite a large group, tend to be about 40 people continuously turned up and ran a similar thing in, in Wollongong. And these were a series of five lectures. In fact, the ones in the Southern Islands were 10. I was, I was forced into that. And so to touch on your comment there that the average person won't cop deep science, I didn't think they would either until I actually started running these courses. And I went into issues around radioisotopes and fission and described the things, much as Tony Irwin does. Um, you, you keep it at a, low, at, at a level of comprehension that people will run with and they're accepting it, but not only that, they are asking for it. They are not, I don't have to go ahead and chase, it, it's, it's coming. So, so they will accept the dialogue provided your delivery method is, is sensitive, provided you ensure that you picked up everyone in the room and, and you, you watch the ones down the corner and you nod and off, you just keep, Keep watching. So yeah, there are that's, that's great. And I'm going to start picking up everyone in the room in a second. But I just say so my my first question was about the questions, and then this is about leadership. And I just want to um, go to David and to Helen before we open up to the room. So David, um, in in establishing the cross party friends group, getting you know colleagues on board, that's uh, that's clearly an act of leadership. Um, is there anything you would like to share with us from your experiences? playing a leadership role in this building and also from your on the ground experiences in the electorate? Well, first of all, in the building, it is a multi-partisan group. Um, Jackie Lambie was also a member of the group and she apologised, she, uh, and Pauline Hens, um, she couldn't because she had other things available uh, that she was you know, booked in for. Uh, and uh, I had no trouble getting National Party members and many Liberal Party members. But we only had to get 21 signatories and we easily did that. We had several signed up publicly uh, Labor Party members uh, in the last parliament and it was a lot easier for them to do that uh, because they were in opposition. But now uh, the, the ALP is very strict on their um, you know, party uh, solidarity and the philosophy and policy coming from the very top, led by Cristal and Albo, they are in lockstep. They are very disciplined in that regard. But there are some quiet supporters, uh, many, in fact, 
uh, particularly in the right side of the political spectrum inside the Labor Party. Out in the community, again, uh, we've been doing surveys in my electorate. I send out to 126,000 uh, people, every letterbox, every post office box gets it. And um, we ask them about nuclear, and it's well over 55%. We'll have a, probably a couple of thousand, even bigger than yours, in a concentrated area. Maybe just our sort of supporters tend to answer those surveys more than um, ones that think the other way. But what I have observed is um, there is, if you can um, give people license to say what they really think um, and out and out say that you're in favour of it at branch meetings or at general discussions, if you say, well, look, I think it's been crazy, I'm really for it and I'd be quite happy, you know, I work with radiotherapy, I use radiation. No one that got radiation for their cancer uh, got killed by the radiation and cured their cancer. And if you validate them to say it's okay, because a few people said, oh, David, I can't really, are we allowed saying that? You know, can we say that we really always thought, why haven't we got nuclear? Uh, if that's happened once, it's probably happened eight or nine times. So that's the feeling that I get. Yeah, I, and I think, um, I think each culture has its own style of leadership. I think in Australia, we, we, we sort of need to find that, that sort of Australian accent, of the Australian voice, that Australian style of leadership. Helen. What, what, what's your reflection? I mean, because you've been exposed to many cultures who've gone through the journey and must have had leaders at key points playing key roles. What, what would you share with us on that? Well, I think what's interesting when we look around the world at the moment is that leadership on the topic is coming from many different areas, many different sectors. I think nuclear energy has been an area where government leadership has been expected that nuclear energy policy would be formulated and driven by by the government, but we're at, we actually have a lot of examples now where it's being driven by industry. And I'll just pick one that I'm very familiar with, which is this tiny little country of Estonia um, in the far north of Europe, where a tiny little company called Fermi and Erga, uh, which started with six people, a shoestring budget, um, has implemented a really incredible program where, and I know that the central focus of their program has been communication. Um, they have gone out systematically and undertaken, I think, lectures at every high school in the country. That was one of their starting points. And it's a small country, so there's not that many high schools to go to. So it, maybe it's a more feasible, um, viable plan. But, but they have really made communication on nuclear uh, central. And in doing so, they have actually convinced the government, and then with a little help from uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, to convince the government that they need to move from a technology neutral position. So they weren't anti nuclear as a country, they just didn't have nuclear energy, but they are now moving full steam ahead, moving very rapidly through the IAEA milestones process and are, are eagerly working towards having electrons on the grid as, as swiftly as possible. So, you know, if I just step back and look, Globally, um, I would make the comment that I think the nuclear industry historically has done a terrible job at communication. It's been extremely reactive in its communication. Something's gone wrong and then they've tried to, you know, say, oh, but, 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 but. Um, I think we need to change that. I think that is changing around the world. And I think that, you know, people who are passionately and proudly pro-nuclear um, need to get up and, and talk more. And we are definitely seeing that happen. Fabulous. Um... I want to ask everyone if they know how, how you can tell if an engineer is an extrovert. Does anyone know? But it's it's when he, and it's usually he, it's when he looks at your shoes rather than his shoes. So uh, so keep keep encouraging us engineers to, to share and speak. And, and Helen, I'm delighted that you mentioned Estonia, a wonderful country, a, a friend of mine drafted the post-Soviet constitution. It, it's, I think Estonia is about the size of Adelaide. Um, and they, they, you know, look at Estonia and what they're doing in various aspects of public policy, deeply inspiring, and then we should ask ourselves, well, if they can do that, why can't we? So I'm going to open it up now um, to questions from the floor. Yes. G'day, Nick Mole, Young Street Initiative from Sydney. Thanks for all the content this morning. There were a number of future forecast scenarios, I think uh, at least one from each Robert, <laughs> uh, which gave us a picture of 60 to 75% nuclear with renewables doing the rest. 
in the light of the costs of grid expansion and so forth and all the negatives of renewables, if we had a blank sheet of paper, would we do the whole thing with nuclear? Okay, essentially when we look at the existing system in our comparisons, we're taking the existing M system and we've got the existing transmission grid. And then when we paste on a nuclear scenario, we're using the same grid. We're not expanding the grid. And therefore, that's why we're seeing that when we use our existing, utilise, we use those existing resources, the maximum ability, then we are, we are seeing the benefit of that come through in a low cost for nuclear. When we put the renewables in, we have that big incremental increase in the transmission amount. And that combined with the redundancy that you've got to build in with the renewable system and combined with the storage and all of those other ancillary services, when you put all of those layers of additional costs, that's what drives the incremental increase. Has that answered your question? Yeah. Oh, can I add something to that? Because um, my research group's actually worked on this as well. So I think, uh, Robert, if I'm not mistaken, your model is what I call a, a what-if model. So it allows the user to say, what would it cost if we had this much nuclear, this much renewables, uh, hydro, whatever. Um, the model that um, uh, we've been working on allows the computer to answer that question. So we ask the computer, uh, all right, these are the constraints. You know, we, no, no CO2 emissions, for example, uh, keep the nuclear ban in place or remove the nuclear ban. And, and what we see is that we see very similar insights to what uh, Robert Barr is seeing, is that the computer will choose for a no emissions system where nuclear is allowed, it will choose a significant, it will choose a significant amount of uh, nuclear, but it will still have some renewables in the mix. This is, a very, this is a very important point we have to emphasize, is the optimum system does still have some renewables in the mix. And that factors in the costs of uh, grid expansion, does it? So yeah. Robert, Robert's work factors in grid expansion in much more detail than we do. Um, and in much more depth, but the, the insights and the broad conclusions are the same. Can I just ask this, Robin, if he would add anything? Uh, just to say that uh, with uh, nuclear as, you know, 70%, 80%, we use the existing grid, pretty much. Uh, as you increase the proportion of renewables, we see costs increase significantly with transmission, but also distribution, which I would have, you would have seen in my slides, and uh, of course, to make it useful, we also need to add costs associated with storage. So all these things combine and go around to drive the costs significantly higher if you drive a lot of renewals in the system. We've got a comment from uh, Dr. Tyree here. Can I just add one thing to that very quickly? Sorry. Yeah, to, yeah do James. Yeah. We, we get asked this quite often, and, and I, I always reply by saying, 100% nuclear energy is only slightly less absurd than 100% renewables. They have different characteristics, they fill different roles in the grid, and that's why a mix, which is complementary, which allows both technologies to play to their strengths, is the only sort of sensible uh, way to go. Yeah. I'd like to add a comment uh, on what Robert made that comment on, uh, we'll call it the grid, the network. Contemplate also two points, Number, and this adds up to cost. Think about how you control 2 million, 3 million, 4 million rooftop and other solars rather than 100 acres or 1,000 acres worth of a solar farm. How do you switch on and off and keep stability in real time with so many renewable energy systems? That's point number one. Point number two is I think that it's also important to add in the extra costs, whether it's hospitals that now can't operate, unless they've got a million dollars worth of a UPS system in their network. And I don't think we've factored all of these costs in. Think about traffic lights that now aren't working as well and crashes and all. So I think there's so many other hidden costs that we haven't considered. But the worst one, I think, is the control of a safe, robust grid. Thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you. There's a, a question. I think the next question is from Michael uh, up here. Thanks, Robert. Uh, just a quick comment and then a question. The first comment is about um, 
uh, I was in, <coughs> excuse me, South Korea just recently, and industry plays a major part in the messaging. Some of the um, experience centres that the industry groups run are tourist attractions in themselves, and they're very, uh, when you experience the, the capabilities of SK Telecom and others which are incorporating energy and so on, you walk away from there thinking like, wow, what a fantastic future. And we don't do that very well here. We're starting to do it with the Western Sydney Airport and other experience centres. But even so, they're very analog in, in the way that they're done. And I, I don't think it gives that experience. But my question is, we didn't mention greenflation and the idea of as demand for land, for wind and solar increases, we start taking the best locations. Then as we need more, we go to the, the less ideal locations which increases price and so on. At the same time, we've got that idea of distribution, connection and so on. Um, the, the other issue we didn't talk about was for rewiring the nation. What about the social licence for that? Because we're already getting protests about the transmission lines. Uh, I, and when people say nuclear, it, we've already missed the boat. I just don't see how rewiring the nation is going to happen politically anytime soon. Thank you. So I think... Um, a small comment. I think when we talk about social license and these things, it needs to be a system level conversation, not a technology level conversation. Um, next uh, question. Did you have a question? Yeah. Just very briefly, just in relation to the role of multiple different energy sources. For my sins, uh, we have a young uh, staff, all of whom are keen engineers. They love uh, nuclear. They also love uh, renewables. How does that play out? Our roof is covered with solar cells. All of the greens and the labor uh, greens, they, they, uh, they come over and visit our building and get their photos taken. No kidding, it's, if I had a dollar for every time a politician came and had the photo taken, I'd, I'd have a lot more dollars. But here's the fun part. The girl who started this in our business, a uh, young lady, uh, Lauren Baird, very smart lady. She inspired us to put solar cells in the building and do some amazing things to the control systems. And now guess where she is? She's now working as the uh, one of the managers in the International Atomic Energy Agency in, uh, in Geneva. And so this is the sort of, I think, the characteristic of, I think, a lot of these undecided people. They, they start to sort of understand the reality. And if I'm, I'm going to put this down for a moment and show you something very important, it's a simple symbol that we could all use. And it's the idea that generation and, and, uh, and demand have to match. So in a commercial building, which is what we've got, we have daytime demand, and with solar energy, we have daytime generation. So it's just like this demand and generation, they overlap. When you have that scenario, it's like, uh, you know, battery behind the meter yeah. effects. It's yeah. relevant to the system. Yeah. That, that's, that's all I want to say. Now, there, there's um, Anastasia Bedford with us here from YGN um, last night. We, just, we decided that uh, there's a whole generation rising up, which is Gen N, uh, and I, I, Gen N, yeah, I learned this five years ago uh, when I first arrived at UQ, when I was shocked to discover that the overwhelming number of students, uh, the young the young generation, were already favourable to nuclear, uh, mildly or strongly was the difference. Um, Anastasia, I think, um, you know, you're, you're involved with YGN, the young generation nuclear, and, uh, but you were not always a nuclear person. Would you, and, and you know, we've, we've got a lot of uh, gray hair here. I just thought that um, as the representative of the new generation, would you like to share with us um, that journey that you've come on? And is there anything that we can learn um, going out from here about uh, communication? So it's true, I do have a bit of a past in history in this. I was an environmental scientist not that long ago. You know, I was a very concerned teenager with kind of the state of the world and the climate and what I could do to change that. So I fell into the very easy trap of seeing renewables as the way out and environmental science as the solution and that was like where I would get the most value for my contributions. And then I visited ANSTO. As a researcher, completely separate to nuclear energy, I visited ANSTO to conduct research. Um, I saw a reactor for the first time in my life. And it's not as scary as I thought it was. I don't know what I thought it was, but I was afraid of it. I was one of those green voters that was anti-nuclear and for no good reason, just through lack of understanding and fear, which is very powerful. 
I'm, I'm pro-nuclear now, and I'm a nuclear researcher, so... I think that to answer the end of your question, it's... The shift is there. There's a lot of undecided people, and that's really powerful. And, like, they just need the experience that I've had, and not everyone's going to have that experience, so it's up to us to have those communications and kind of convey, you know, the, there's no need to be afraid of it. And it's very safe, and it is a part of the renewable grid that is the solution to what a lot of us are concerned about here. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, folks, we've come to the top of the hour. Um, and uh, so, D David, did you? I'm going to hand the uh, hand the microphone back to you as our as our host, and uh, it's all yours. Thanks, Stephen. Um, I might just ask a couple of closing comments from Aidy and James, uh, and then we'll wrap up. Yeah, I, I thank you very much to everybody who's been involved. Uh, from my perspective, uh, the journey towards um, a rational grid is a conversation in which we uh, are deeply respectful of other people's views, uh, but we engage on the facts. I think that any strategies that try to avoid using the word nuclear and hoping it's going to disappear into the woodwork probably won't work. But there's some really cool words, all right, like actually low-cost electricity, low carbon, lowest carbon, safe, always on. I think our narrative is to talk about the sort of future that Aussies aspire to and that we usually get when we apply our minds and then we apply our votes. So this journey for me to become to a place like uh, Parliament to have this conversation, such a privilege because I had the opportunity to uh, lead ANSTO. Uh, I also had the opportunity to work with people to allow us to join the Generation 4 International Forum, a treaty body with bipartisan support of the Parliament of Australia on future reactive technology. So Parliament has anticipated the future and has already taken a decision to know about the reactors of the future. This is not a discussion where we have to win an argument, but to remind ourselves that the wisdom of this Parliament has already been applied to this area. Uh, we're just catching up. James, have you got some comments? Thanks, uh, David. I, I think the only thing I would add is my, my um, journey to become a, a promoter and advocate for nuclear energy started as a technical and economic thing. And then in the course of researching the history of energy and its relationship to human development and well-being, it became a cultural and social concern for me. If we look back to the start pre-industrial revolution, there was no such thing as a working class. There was maybe a few yeoman farmers, most people were indentured. Their social mobility consisted of joining the Navy. Access high quality energy, human knowledge, raw materials, and we start to see improving living conditions. In fact, we see an exponential growth in them. The second half of the Industrial Revolution saw the appearance of a working class, a prosperous working class with a high degree of social mobility, something we utterly take for granted because we've only ever known it in Australia. And so my concern is if we sever that relationship with energy, we relegate, we may relegate our working class, many of us would have sprung from, to being the working poor, and their social mobility will go back to pre-industrial social mobility. So it's not technical and economic, it's much bigger than that. Thanks, James. Uh, well, um, we have reached our time limits. Um, this is not a one-man job. We have had so much help uh, from everyone, all of your panellists, Peter Showquist, Peter Tyree, and many others who've helped me. I'd like to thank my office um, for their diligence and help, our cameraman, uh, Jordan, Rob, uh, and the whole team. Uh, for all my fellow parliamentarians, um, I hope you've enjoyed it and learned something um, so that you feel comfortable um, prosecuting the case armed with facts and also, Dorian, your, your words and insights are really valuable. Aidy, you have got those words so well. Uh, I think we should send everyone those terms, always on, always spinning, uh, and all those... 
those uh, buses. Things that make people feel comfortable. Um, so I'm going to be hanging around for a while if anyone else wanted to ask any questions. Um, but people have got planes and trains and cars to do. So uh, the parliamentary friends of nuclear industries will continue having meetings throughout this parliament and we'll engage more with our um, other party members, um, particularly in the Labor Party, who I get on very well with. Um, but please be reassured that what you see in question time isn't what it's always like the rest of the time. And thank you.